Good afternoon, Brian, and welcome to the Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337 and our special Masonic Esoterica Lockdown Symposium. This is an idea that's come around on the back of our weekly lockdown lecture series, and it's a bit of a challenge bringing uh, five of the world's leading Masonic Esoteric speakers together. I can certainly say that I will be making a daily advancement today because the esoteric side of Freemasonry is something that I am not very clued up on, albeit I have read this very interesting book, Contemplating Craft Freemasonry by uh, Kirk McNulty and a variety of other books. I, I, the way that I learn is always uh, by taking it in from a brother presenting it to me, and which is something that I hope to do this afternoon. However, we do still need to do the, the admin, Bern, and can I remind you of the Grand Lodge of Scotland law uh, and rules on uh, Zoom meetings. Can I ask you please to keep your video on? Uh, this is uh, an instruction from the Grand Lodge of Scotland and please have a name that is recognisable, that is your name in the, the screen. Uh, if you're out with our jurisdiction and you need to switch uh, the video off, please send me a little message in the chat and we can deal with it that way, Brian. Uh, this afternoon, we have got a, a wonderful array of talents uh, joining us to help us with our daily advancement. First up will be uh, Brother Stuart Cleland talking about esotericism and giving a bit of an academic introduction to the subject. He will be followed by Brother Joe Wages, uh, who will talk about the Golden Rosy Cross and the original Masonic Rosicrucian. Uh, Followed by Ian Robertson, who will talk about the influence of Scottish Rosicrucianism and the, arguably the birth of modern day Freemasonry. Now, I think that's something that uh, there's many Scots around uh, the screens today and we, we love a good debate and a, a, a good argument. Uh, for comfort, we'll have a 10 minute comfort break about 10 past three to 20 past three. And what I would ask respectfully, Brian, you don't switch off your Zoom, you don't leave the meeting. Uh, because you may not get back in because we're slowly getting up to the maximum uh, of 100 attendees. After the break, we will be welcoming Brother Jamie Paul Lamb from the US uh, to talk about astrological symbolism and Freemasonry. And the only time I've really come across that is a couple of times in my own province, Fife and Kinross, lodged in Ern 400 and they're building on the roof. They've got astrological symbols and one of the old buildings uh, in the province that is not now used as a, a Masonic uh, temple had astrological symbols. And I do have in my collection a history book that shows uh, the, the symbols that were surrounding Lodge Union 250's building. Uh, the afternoon will be rounded up by another one of our lockdown lecture speakers, Brother Martin Folks, who will talk about the Tomb of Christian Rosenkrauts and the Memory Palace. Uh, each speaker has been given 40 minutes, uh, and that includes their presentation. There may be some time for questions at the end of each of them, but that's up to the discretion of each speaker. Uh, we will moderate the question and answer. So if you do have a question, please put it into the chat. We will ensure that later this evening on the Lodge Hope of Karachi pages, any questions aired will be put up there and that we can try and get an answer from one of our speakers for you. I very much hope you all have a fantastic afternoon learning about esoteric Freemasonry. I'm certainly very much looking forward to it. And on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of Karachi who are here this afternoon, can I welcome each and every one of our visitors to this session. Uh, with that in mind, and I've been able to uh, claw four minutes back uh, for Stuart, I will now hand over to Brother Stuart Cleland. Uh, Stuart is a, a teacher of philosophy and religious studies in and around the northeast of Scotland. Uh, I, I've known Stuart for probably about 10 years or so now uh, through various Masonic things, and I think we actually met in a pub locally to me uh, at one point uh, just after you joined the craft, Stuart. I, I remember that. I, his research background is centered on esoteric spirituality and the practice of heterodox religious traditions with a particular interest in marginalized and perse persecuted religious communities, both historical and contemporary. 
His research en engages with religious studies, specifically in the so-called Western esoteric tradition or hermetic tradition and religious and philosophical thought. Stuart's a member of the Royal Order of Scotland, the Societis Rosicruciana in Scotia, as well as the 18th degree Prince Rosequa, and he regularly, regularly lectures throughout Scotland and beyond. Brian, I'm pleased to introduce Brother Stuart Cleland. Thank you, God. Did you just hit screen share and that will... You should be able to do that now. Ah, there we go. Okay, good afternoon, Brennan. My name's Stuart Cleland, and today I'm going to be discussing esotericism. I'm going to be approaching this topic from an academic uh, perspective. And although I've chosen that perspective, I will also discuss the strengths and weaknesses of that approach to this topic. Esotericism, as Sean Iyer writes, is a word that fills the minds of some with beautiful and arcane truths. For others, the term brings to mind unpleasant and tiresome lectures about unlikely artificial interpretations of the craft and other Masonic degrees. For most, it is a word that is only half familiar, having something vaguely to do with mysticism and supposed Masonic secrets. Roughly speaking, Esotericism is concerned with the hidden inner dimensions of spirituality. And today, myself and other speakers will try to shed some light on the meaning of the word and the traditions it represents. First of all, let us define the word mystery, as the mysteries or the ancient mysteries are usually where most begin their explanation. Mystery comes from the word mysteria, which is made up of the verb mule, meaning to close, as in close the mouth in secrecy or to close the eyes, and teria, meaning festival, Accordingly, the word mysteria means the festival at which the secret is communicated, an apt word then for Freemasonry. Indeed, as Masons, we are left ultimately on our own to contemplate the mysteries of death, life and truth beyond the festive board. Even during our degrees, there is but a dim light barely illuminating our surroundings. On the other hand, the Western esoteric traditions, of which some say Freemasonry is a part, aims to take that small divine spark and make of it a fire within. For the Masonic esotericist, there is a profound connection between the world and connection, between God, cosmos and man, or in the words of Hermes Trismegistus, who will come to know shortly, he who contemplates himself with his mind knows himself and knows the all, the all is in man. Throughout the ages, people have experienced and testified to this inner connection between the visible world and God, Freemasonry being only one manifestation. However, many who have expressed these ideas have been marginalised or killed, the books banned or burned. Indeed, a great many have died over the last 2,000 years defending the very ideas we are about to discuss. Esotericism is a historical tradition then. It has its roots in a religious way of thinking which reach back to three great spiritual traditions known as Hermetism, Gnosticism and Neoplatonism all of which come from the Hellenistic, that is Greek speaking world of the first few centuries after Christ. So whilst the term ancient mysteries is correct, the historical reality is that they originate in relatively late antiquity. These three traditions form the basis of the Western esoteric traditions. It's from these spiritual traditions that all other later practices such as magic or alchemy, theosophy, Rosicrucianism, and ultimately Freemasonry are sprung. But it is important to note that their influence is almost always via an indirect route. It is these three traditions I'm going to focus on in my, uh, my talk today, brother. Let's first of all take a quick look at these three main sources before we move uh, back to them later in greater depth. Hermetism is the first one we're going to look at. Now, Hermetism, or Hermetic science, has its origins in the first century BC. It is based on the writings attributed to the mythical figure known as Hermes Trismegistus. That is a Hellenized form of the Egyptian god Toth. The Hermetic tradition has been respected in Egyptian, Roman, Christian, Jewish, and Islamic religions, many believing that it represents a continuation of the Egyptian temple or mystery schools. Hermetism 
inspired many Renaissance mystics and scholars. And modern evolutions of this tradition are often referred to as Hermeticism, as in the famous Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, for example, of which a number of Scottish Freemasons were members, including John Brodie Innes and Robert Falcon. In any case, Hermetism emphasised the connection of the divine and the earthly and the maxim, as above, so below. Secondly, we're going to look at something called Gnosticism. Gnosticism was one of the early varieties of the Judeo-Christian tradition, gaining a great deal of modern influence, uh, interest since the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945, and to some extent the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. The individual groups that we call Gnostics today emphasised individual, the personal, and the knowledge of God known as Gnosis. This is believed to reside within the innermost being. This Gnosis then allows a person to enter into union or become at one with the source of all creation. Persecuted throughout the 4th to 5th centuries AD, Gnostics continued their spiritual practice, moving across Europe, including southern France, where they were driven underground in the 14th century. Finally, we're going to look at something called Neoplatonism. This was the last flowering of classical Greek philosophical uh, thinking. The Neoplatonists combined the approaches of Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras and others, addressing the individual yearning for salvation from a philosophical rather than purely religious point of view. Neoplatonism believes in a single source from which all creation emanates and with which an individual soul can be mystically united. This philosophical school provided ways that the individual could ascend the ladder of being through the contemplation of the divine. Neoplatonic approaches have continued to be of tremendous importance in Islamic, Christian and Jewish mysticism, as well as in forming Rosicrucian and Freemasonic lodges. These are the foundational traditions from which all other practices associated with esotericism are indirectly derived. Magic, alchemy, astrology, as they all are presented to us today, have in some form or another theories or concepts based in these ancient spiritual traditions. Now, if all this seems interesting, eh, how do you begin to study this topic? How do you begin to study esotericism? Well, generally, there are four main ways or approaches that you study eh, esotericism by. It's important that you decide for yourself which of these approaches you want to take. But me, even more importantly, you bear this in mind when you're reading books about esotericism. Always ask yourself, what approach is the author taking? As it will greatly alter how they present the material to you. History is a cacophony of competing voices and narratives. Esotericism is no different. So, first of all, let's have a look at something called the insider approach or the emic approach. Now, this approach states that there is, in fact, a hidden truth in philosophy and spirituality dating back a millennia that has been passed down the ages by a secret tradition. This is a study of esotericism from within a tradition. For example, studying esotericism solely from the perspective of a Freemason or a Rosicrucian or some other self-contained mystical school. Often those that follow this approach suggest that they have access to something known as a Prisca Theologica or a pristine theology, which is a hidden mystical truth which unites all spiritual, religious, philosophical, even scientific wisdom into one. Overall, this is considered a non-academic approach for many different reasons, but mainly due to the large number of largely self-appointed gurus and grand initiates that refuse to take part in serious academic discourse and the tradition they actually claim to believe in or live by often selectively cherry-picking from uh, the whole history of esotericism in order to construct a sort of spiritual buffet, which is often dangerous and can lead to profound misunderstandings and indeed intentional misreadings, all of which, in my mind, leads to a kind of disrespectful and entitled attitude towards traditions and ideas that people literally died for in order for us to study. Of course, this doesn't mean that you can't do academic study from inside a tradition. Many religious people study religion, for example. It's just that you have to be careful to switch hats from the commitments of one's own tradition and the scholarly vigour of academic study required in order to show due respect for the sacrifice of those that have gave their life that we have the opportunity to learn this stuff.
That being said, let us look at the first academic approach, known as a structural approach. This is represented by the French author Anton Favre. This approach attempts to build an academic boundary around what we can actually call esoteric. It states that all esoteric philosophies or traditions have a set, a set of six unifying similarities or motifs. And if all are present, that can be called an esoteric tradition. They are as follows. Number one, correspondences. That there exists a link between all things in the cosmos. Planets, humans, animals, plants, minerals, the elements, all are considered linked in one way or another through a series of correspondences or analogies. For example, in many esoteric traditions, there's often a connection made between the metal silver and the moon. One affects the other. This connection is not understood casually, but rather symbolically through the ancient idea of the macrocosm, that is the universe or the heavens, being reflected in some way in the microcosm, that is the components of the human body, and expressed in the hermetic idea, as above, so below. Number two, live in nature. This is the idea that the cosmos is alive. Rather than just being matter, the idea understands the cosmos as a complex entity that is animated by a certain living energy, a soul. Just as human beings have souls, so too does the world. This is known as a world soul, and it's sometimes understood as geometry, sometimes understood as energy. Number three, imagination and mediation. This is the idea that the imagination is in fact a kind of organ of sorts, an organ of the soul. It is an organ that can perceive the hidden reality beyond this physical realm, through which we can establish a relationship with the heavens. Number four, an experience of transmutation. Esotericism does not describe some kind of intellectual knowledge, but rather an understanding that fundamentally changes the initiate. Just as there is a change in material state in alchemy, so there is a change in the person as a result of receiving certain illuminated knowledge or gnosis. By virtue of this revealed knowledge, the human being experiences an inner transformation or a second birth from a rough ashlar to a smooth. Number five, the practice of concordance. The all esoteric traditions and practices such as Kabbalah, Tarot, Alchemy, Freemasonry, they're all connected. The implication is that these traditions all sprang from a single authentic divine source of inspiration, representing branches in an ancient theology, a prisca theologica. And finally, number six, transmission. This is the idea that certain knowledge can only be passed down through generations by the proper means, from a master to an apprentice, through an established path of initiation, such as the initiation into a society where the different grades represent access to different ideas or knowledge. So, according to this approach, any philosophy or tradition that exhibits all these characteristics can be called an esoteric philosophy. The question is, does Freemasonry contain all six commonalities or criteria? The second approach we're going to look at today is known as a historical critical approach. This is a fully academic approach that suggests esoteric philosophy and esoteric thinking are influenced not by genuine divine inspiration, but created by events such as politics or economics. It suggests that spirituality arises from a, not from revelation, but from society changes, societal changes rather, such as war, famine, and scientific changes. Take for example, if we had a discussion today about seances and the spiritualism in 19th century Britain, and suggested that this happened due to Darwin's theories of evolution and the spiritual anxiety caused by the industrial revolution, rather than any actual divine revelation or supernatural experiences, if we made such claims, then that would be the historical critical approach. Now, whilst that approach is helpful and indeed needed at times, if it's applied too strictly to this subject, it manifests a kind of arrogant dismissal of one's own subject as neither true or relevant. And finally, the last approach we're going to look at today is known as the religionist approach. Now, this is the one that I would advocate to you. This is sometimes known as taking a sympathetic neutral stance or sympathetic neutrality. We need to study esotericism in its own terms. We need to recognize that some people claim to have spiritual experiences and recognize them as genuine encounters 
while still applying scholarly and academic conventions to our conclusions. This approach argues basically that if you're going to study esotericism, you're going to be studying things that are transcendental or otherworldly and trying to understand them within space and time through concepts of history and politics, you fail to properly grasp the nature of what's being said. In any case, it's important that you decide which of these approaches you want to take and learn them about this fascinating topic. Now, esoteric ideas and philosophies often appear during the breakdown of orthodoxies and established social norms. In times of change, decline or transformation, new esoteric spiritualities appear. Neoplatonic and Gnostic works were produced within the changes of the Roman Empire, where there was globalization, urbanization and multiculturalism that produced a form of personal approach eh, or personal approaches to God. It's no surprise then that given the current global situation, we are having this discussion today. In the 19th century, for example, when Europe entered a period of sustained urban and industrial growth, combined with a breakdown of organised religion, we see an increase in occult and esoteric societies. In Scotland, for example, we have the establishment of the Societis Rosicruciana in Scotia, the Theosophical Society, and a number of other high Masonic degrees, including the Order of Misram. As we see the breakdown of established norms within today's wider world and Freemasonry's own decline, it is no surprise that we see an increased desire for the craft to return to an embrace of these esoteric ideas. Masonic authors that have claimed Masonry's direct lineage to these foundational traditions include Arthur Edward Waite, a John Yarker, Manly P. Hall and William Wynne Westcott, all, cl all claiming that hidden throughout the various grades and degrees of Freemasonry is access to a secret tradition or Prisca Theologica. Now, clearly, not everyone is going to agree with the idea or the sentiments that Freemasonry has anything at all to to do with esotericism. As recently as 2012, the Grand Master of New South Wales and Australian Capital Territory, Derek Robson, proclaimed a Grand Lodge edict stating, regular Freemasonry does not permit within it any form of, which, sorry, any form of esotericism which encompasses or tends towards occultism, sorcery, alchemy, astrology, profane mysticism, transcendentalism, supernaturalism, Druidism, Rosicrucianism, Satanism, or any concept or movement related to any of these. The presentation, endorsement, and or promotion of such subjects in any lodge holding under the United Grand Lodge of New South Wales and Australian Capital Territory, whether the lodge be opened, adjourned, at refreshment, or closed, or at a or connected or associated lodge function, should be deemed irregular and is strictly forbidden. Unfortunately, I'm unable to provide you with the academic approach utilised to reach this conclusion. In any case, the Western esoteric tradition, whether you believe that it has influenced Freemasonry or not, has continuously influenced individual Freemasons and still does today. These traditions have their basis in a distinct way of thinking about the divine man and the universe, which stretches right back into classical antiquity and has continuously inspired important and influential Freemasons. Ancient Egypt was a cradle of these religious ideas, but this was not the Egypt of pharaohs. In the period of time we're talking about, the last pharaoh of the last dynasty had already been defeated, and Alexander the Great had founded a great city there in his own name. Once Alexander the Great conquered most of the Western world, fighting his way into India, the cosmopolitan influx created an empire rich in mixed and diverse spiritualities. When Alexander died, Egypt became absorbed into the Roman Empire, an ancient culture of temples, pyramids, and exotic gods, now mixed with Greek philosophies and Oriental religions within Hellenistic Roman Egypt, and it became a crucible of religion, magic, astrology, and alchemy. Its distinct ways of thinking and its spiritual traditions are at the heart of the Western esoteric traditions. Fundamental among our sources for esotericism are what's called the Hermetica, 
These are the Hermetic writings. This is a diverse collection of writings on theosophy, astrology, magic, and they all have their origins in Hellenistic Alexandria. The texts contain different teachings and revelations attributed to the mythical figure known as Hermes Trismegistus or Hermes the Thrice Great, an ancient sage identified with Toth, the Egyptian god of wisdom and magic. Toth had become fused with the Greek god Hermes, and this new god was to become a powerful influence on the whole development of esoteric thought from ancient antiquity all the way through through to its revived form in Renaissance Europe. The most influential Hermetic text, rediscovered in 1460, is called the Hoc Corpus Hermeticum, which brings together 17 books written in Greek uh, in the second and third centuries AD. Its rediscovery, after being lost for a thousand years, caused a great deal of excitement for its Renaissance audience and led to a revival of hermetic thinking throughout the 15th and 16th century. The earliest academic attempts at showing a link between Freemasonry and this form of revised uh, Renaissance hermeticism are those of the now largely discredited scholar Francis Yates. Through the concept of something known as the art of memory, she, she suggested a possible influence of the Hermetic tradition on Masonic history. Yeats developed the idea in a now classic book that the secret of Freemasonry had nothing to do with building techniques of operative stonemasons, but what she called imaginative or speculative architecture practiced through the art of memory. Now, whilst these ideas were first put forward by Yeats, they were famously taken up by Professor David Stevenson of the University of St Andrews, a scholar firmly placed in the historical critical approach. His book on the early history of Freemasonry in Scotland is based on meticulous historical research. More importantly for our topic, he proposed a radical reinterpretation of a fragment of a well-known uh, document uh, known as the Second Shaw Statues. William Shaw was a master of works at the court of James VI, appointed to that office in 1583, and therefore in charge of all royal building projects. It seems that he attempted to try and reorganise the Scottish Masons, issuing two sets of statutes in 1598 and 1599, which relegated uh, not only formal obligations and duties of the stone masons, but also their Masonic education. Every apprentice had to choose a tutor who would teach him the secrets of the craft, which had to be memorized and never written down. And the warden of the lodge was to take trial of the art of memory and science thereof of every fellow craft and every apprentice. Now, earlier Masonic historians had treated that phrase, the art of memory, as simply referring to the need to remember the lessons. But Professor Stevenson believed that it clearly meant the art of memory found within Renaissance hermetic revivals, which are championed by the likes of Giannardo Bruno, a key influence on early Scottish Freemasons such as Sir Robert Murray. As he put it, that single short phrase provides a key to understanding major aspects of the origins of masonry, linking the operative mason craft with the mighty strivings of the hermetic magus. We see here again how the University of St Andrews stands at odds with the Grand Lodge of South Wales on matters masonic and esoteric. Key themes of hermetic philosophy include uh, the idea of as above, so below. We are asked to reflect the universe within our own mind, to grasp the divine air essence in you. This we are equipped to do because we have been born with a divine intellect. We are called to internalize the cosmos within our mind. Hence the development within the revived Renaissance hermetic tradition of memorization skills, memory palaces and the art of memory, possibly referenced in the Shaw statutes. In the famous first book of the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, that is the key text of Herm Hermetic philosophy, uh, known as the Palmandres or the Divine Parmanda, you will find here a dialogue between the god Nous and Hermes. Hermes Trismegistus here plays a role of an initiator into wisdom and the mysteries. In Hermeticism, man is summoned to make himself equal to God 
in order to apprehend God. If you do not make yourself equal to the God, you cannot understand him. Like is understood by like. We might recall here the first three words a candidate speaks before the altar in their obligation for the first degree. According to hermetic philosophy, the universe is a book to be read. The creator God is known by the contemplation of his creation. God's signature or hieroglyph is found throughout nature. Because of this, there is a lack of dualism within hermetic philosophy, since the world is recognized as being of divine origin. There is an acceptance of the world, even though there might be some pessimism about the consequences of the fall. The Hermetic Project is all about transmutation of the lower into something higher. Humanity is called to reintegration with the divine. Because humanity is connected both to the divine and the earthly realms, man is able to help the earth recover to its former glory state. Hermeticism then is a form of green philosophy as it were. Closely related to Hermetism is Neoplatonism. Now, this is based on the works of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. The Neoplatonists expanded and elaborated on the works of Plato. Neoplatonic philosophy is characterized by the idea that there exists a great hierarchy of being descending down from God, the last and the lowest hierarchy being the world that humans perceive. Once again, during the Renaissance, alongside a, the Hermetic revival, there was a Neoplatonic revival. Platonic and Neoplatonic writings were rediscovered and translated for the first time in centuries. And when it came, it came with a great interest in something known as the world soul. This world soul, or anima mundi, was believed to be an intrinsic connection between all living things. Just as humans have a soul, the world has a soul, and human souls can be connected to the world soul. The world soul was an animating principle for all creation, and for some, that world soul represented as geometry. It was believed that the human soul in relation to the world soul was unique and has access to all levels of transcendental knowledge. For the Renaissance esotericist, it is through the agency of this world soul that the soul of man may in fact allow itself to be possessed, as it were, by the spirit of the world or the world soul, and hence achieve a glimpse upwards through the divine tracing board of the entire microcosm, macrocosm, and achieve a sort of union, a reintegration with the divine mind. This process of being possessed by the spirit of the world or world soul is achieved by what we might term as worldly possession. Furthermore, we might find the following passage from Plato himself quite interesting from his famous book called The Timaeus, which was written regarding uh, the creation of the world. In this section, Plato discusses the creation of human bone marrow. The marrow itself is created out of other materials. God took the primary triangles as were straight and smooth and were adapted to their perfection to produce fire and water and air and earth. These he separated from their kinds, and mingling them in due proportion with one another, made the marrow of them to be the universal seed of the whole race of mankind. And in this seed he then planted and enclosed the soul. That which, like a field, was to receive the divine seed he made round every way, and called the portion of the marrow brain. But that which was intended to contain the remaining immortal part of the soul, he distributed into figures at once around and elongated, and he called them all by the name Marrow, and to these, as to anchors, fastened the bonds of the whole soul. He proceeded to fashion around them the entire framework of our body, constructing for the Marrow, first of all, a complete covering of bone. Now, Gnosticism, the last uh, of the spiritual traditions we're going to look at today, is a difficult topic to try and make generalizations about. Is there are so many different groups of Gnostics and they varied in their different degrees to how they deviated from Orthodox Christianity. But many central Gnostic beliefs were not rooted in the Bible or Christian tradition. And they often conformed elements of Christianity to fit in with other Greek Platonic ideas about spirituality. Since Gnosticism was such, uh, was such a diverse movement, there are many different ways to try and categorize it. 
And while the early church rejected Gnostic Christianity as heretical, there's still some today that would call it Christian. Gnosticism can, however, be defined by its special emphasis it gives to a special type of knowledge of God and higher realities known as Gnosis. Many Gnostics believe in a radical form of dualism between good and evil, between light and dark. The Gnostic often traces all creation back to a special first principle. This pure, perfect and supreme power is eternal, infinite and absolute. This God is a hidden deity, unknown and unknowable. The whole universe is a process of emanations from this divine principle embodied in a variety of mythological figures known as aeons. Christ is often identified as one of the aeons and as a redeemer and an agent of this supreme God, but not as wholly divine. Now, this universe of ours, the Gnostics believe, is not the product of God as we know him, but by an inferior being known as the Demiurge. This secondary God or evil being was borrowed for Plato's book, the Timaeus. Gnostics view the existence of a, well, Gnostics view existence in two terms, as two contrasting worlds. One is the eternal world of God and the heavens filled a whole host of angelic beings. The other is this world of illusion and change. Here man is trapped, separated from the real God by the demiurge who created this world, a defective world. However, Gnosis, the divine spark that's found within, can restore man to his he a heavenly origins. Now, importantly, the Gnostics identified Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, as this evil demiurge who is hostile to the supreme God of the New Testament. The Gnostics decried the Hebrew deity as an evil, angry, and jealous God who severely chastises his people. It is that God that made the world. Gnostics rejected the Old Testament as a play for Jewish supremacy. This has led some to suggest that Gnosticism was an anti-Semitic movement. This is an aspect of Gnosticism that many people gloss over. Gnosticism is different from Hermetism and Neoplatonism. While Hermetism and Neoplatonism are optimistic about the world, Gnosticism is pessimistic and world-hating. It portrays a tragic and humiliating image of man. So, in conclusion, we might say the extent to which Freemasonry is an esoteric tradition is ultimately a personal question for its membership. However, there certainly has been deeply, overtly esoteric orders of Freemasonry over the last 250 years, which we'll hear about next with the following speakers. But I want to finish today by briefly discussing a one order to help summarise my points regarding esotericism and Freemasonry. As the high degrees of Freemasonry swept across the landscape of 18th century Europe, an obscure and occult order started to develop, known as the Lord de Chevalier Maison Elu de Cohen de l'Univers, or the Order of the Night Mason Elect Cohen's of the Universe, more commonly known as the Elu Cohen's, requiring the utmost commitment and a decidedly um, monastic lifestyle, the order prescribed everything from hairstyle to diet. Far from the everyday festivities of modern uh, Freemasonry, the Elder Cohen saw themselves as spiritual warriors engaged in magical combat with angelic and demonic ent entities, and they used Masonic ritual in order to do this. The original rites of the Elder Cohen instruct the initiate how to enter into relations with angelic spirits which are sympathetic to man's now fallen state and who aid him in the path towards reintegration with the divine. Founded by the charismatic figure Martinez de Pasquale, it had three sets of degrees. The first were analogous to the symbolic degrees of conventional Freemasonry. The second were generally Masonic, but they hinted at Pasquale's own secret doctrine. The third were blatantly magical. For example, they would use exorcism against the evil in the world generally and to, against individuals. In the highest degree, the Ruqua, the initiate was taught to use magic to contact spiritual realms beyond the physical. And the drawn and magical uh, circles on the lodge floor featured heavily. In the Elu Cohen, we see a clear example of esotericism and its intersection with Freemasonry.
If you wish to find out more about that particular order uh, and its rituals, uh, there's a new edition of the book that I put out with Joe Wages and Steve Adams through Lewis Masonic Publishing coming out shortly. Brethren, thank you for your time and your attention. Brother Stuart Clellan, thank you so much for being our first speaker this afternoon and opening up our Masonic Esoterica Lockdown Symposium. I think the rest of the brand here will agree with me. That was a, a very, very interesting uh, opening presentation and probably sets the scene for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, it does give to the, the lay Freemason uh, an understanding of the different elements of it. And it certainly has helped uh, a bit of my understanding in trying to piece together the, the works of Hall and the likes of McNulty and some of the things I've heard you speak about in the past and some of our speakers coming up. Uh, I, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, I can see and thank you to the Bern who are putting suggestions of books into the chat. Uh, and let's just see, I think Matthew Christmas was thinking there might be a, a question. Uh, question then from uh, Brother Matthew Christmas to you, Stuart. Uh, the slide on Gnosticism showed a figure on a Hellenistic coin. Please, would you say more about that? Well, it's a depiction of the, the demiurge, as far as I know. This is the, the idea that, uh, you know, there's a, a secondary god, an evil god that created the world. For Gnostics, the way they viewed the world was that there was this divine element, this uh, first principle, that all it did was think. And when it thinks, it thinks thoughts. Those thoughts become manifestations of that supreme being. And those manifestations go on to think. And they make other beings. And through the process of intellect, you start to see different uh, emanations coming through, the different spheres of existence. Eventually, we get to Sophia, which is divine knowledge. Uh, and by this point, they've started to become male and female. And Sophia uh, wants to uh, copy the supreme being by just making creation. But what she's supposed to do is have a, a husband or a male counterpart from which to make another being. But she decides that she's not going to do that. She's just going to emanate another being and copy what the supreme being had been doing. And the entity that is born from her doing that is known as the, the Demiurge. And the Demiurge wants to copy Sophia. And he creates the earth that we live in. And what he's done is basically create beings from dirt, mud people. Gnostics believe that most people are mud people. But some have been born with the ability to reach into themselves and bring out something called the divine spark. Now, this isn't for everyone. And Jesus plays the character of the initiator who can come along to people who have this divine spark and, and stop them being mud people and help them return back to God. But it is a knowledge that brings salvation. Regular Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, it's just an acceptance of Jesus. But in Gnosticism, it's a certain type of knowledge, a secret esoteric knowledge that a few have. And this idea really becomes important in the history of Western esotericism. There are a few with secret knowledge that can bring salvation. Okay, thank you, Stuart. There's a, a follow-on comment from that and uh, another question. Uh, the, the comment from Andrew Fear, I think that was the Gnostic serpent. He isn't always evil, nor indeed is the Demiurge. Demiurge, it depends what Gnostics you're dealing with. Matthew, goes on to ask, I understand the serpent demiurge illustration. The previous one has what looked like a personified cock with a whip. Is that the demiurge too? Uh, Abracax, I think it's called. Uh, in Gnosticism, there's a whole host of mythological characters, all different manifestations of the supreme being, and I believe that one is Abrax. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got uh, another question from Murat. What kind of esotericism we can speculate for Jesuits? 
For the Jesuits, well, it's difficult to say. I'm not really an expert on the Jesuits, but I believe, you know, it's a society of God. And I would suspect uh, the society, sorry, society of Jesus. For a long time, the Gnostic texts, some of the Gnostic texts were known. And it's likely that the Jesuits were interested in this type of idea of revelation coming from knowledge, a type of learning that is going to help you uh, reach salvation, not just a pure acceptance of Jesus and uh, Jesus' promise and resurrection, but a certain specific knowledge that's going to enlighten you from within. And it's only going to be a few people that have that knowledge that's going to unlock the key, unlock the gates, back up the emanations, back up the hierarchy towards uh, God. We see this in a Christian context, a more accepted Christian context, in the writings of Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagite. He was a very influential uh, Christian, early Christian thinker. It's actually from him that we get the word hierarchy. And he mixed Platonic ideas uh, with Christian ideas. And many of the things that I've been discussing today are basically Plato mixing with a local culture. Gnosticism is Plato mixing with a local Palestinian uh, culture, the, the Levant. Uh, Hermitism is Plato mixing with the Egyptian content. Plato mixing with Christianity. Plato mixing with Islamic ideas. Plato is a philosophy through which you can experience your own religion or confession. And that's why we get a rise in esotericism, Plato being viewed through certain local contexts. Okay, thank you, Stuart. I've got one more question, and then we've got a question from our next speaker, which I'll use to help me introduce Brother Joe Ages. So the, the final question for you uh, is from Jedediah French. Is pure Freemasonry an inherently Platonic philosophical practice? I think it can certainly be viewed as such. My impression of esotericism and Freemasonry is that Freemasonry does provide a, a secret tradition. It does provide a path, but it's secret only insofar as it's a personal path. The path I take will be different from the path you take, and it's only going to be known to me. You can reach Freemasonry as a completely social uh, organization. It can be a friendly organization, or you can approach it through the lens of Plato. You can approach it through the lens of esotericism. Uh, it is really down to the individual to find their own path through these degrees. Certainly for me, and I would say a lot of the uh, Freemasons, that uh, the symbolism, the uh, degree work, all helps live this type of philosophy. It's all present if you want it to be. Okay, thanks, Stuart. And uh, if I can ask you just to very quickly answer Brother Joe's question before I introduce him, was Gnosticism really an aberrant, an aberrant form of Christianity, or was it primarily a post-dispora Judaism? Well, it depends. Again, there's so many different uh, branches of Gnosticism that even the term Gnosticism is debatable, whether that is a word that's of any use, because it tries to lump people together that in many ways, are, are, have quite different separate ideas. Uh, I think generally the Gnostic myth, the idea that there is a, more than one a god, that there is a, this world is evil, is a, a kind of aberration of an orthodox Christian point of view because a, 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 it, it rejects the resurrection of, of Jesus in many ways. It rejects Jesus' divinity. There's many different things that Christians disagree on, but you have to agree that Jesus resurrected. Uh, I think if you don't, then it's probably closer to Judaism or a local religious culture of that, uh, closer to the reality of that time. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Stuart, once again, on behalf of everyone here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi and our Masonic Esoterica Symposium, thank you for being our first guest presenter. I do hope and trust that you can stay with us as long as your personal time can allow this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bren, uh, it's a great delight to, to welcome back one of our lockdown lecture speakers, uh, Brother Joe Wages. Uh, 
brother Joe is a, a member of uh, a Freemason, 32nd degree over in the United States of America. He's a member of the Blue Friars, a member of Plano Lodge number 768 and uh, Lodge 802 and a member of the Dallas Valley of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Uh, a fellow of the Grand College of Rights, a full member of the Texas Lodge of Research, Mich Michigan Lodge of Research, and a life member of the Missouri Lodge of Research. He's the editor of The Secret School of Wisdom, The Authentic Rituals and Doctrines of the Illuminati, uh, something in French that I always get wrong, Le Col Secret de Sages, Rituals et Doctrines Authentiques des Illuminati, uh, uh, a book on materialism and idealism and a treasury of contexts in two volumes. He's currently preparing the forthcoming books, Equosi Masonry, A History of the High Degrees from the Scottish Master to the Order of the Royal Secret for SRS, the Columbian Illuminati and the Improved System of the Illuminati. So, Bern, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, Brother Joe Wages. Joe, uh, you now have 40 minutes to lead the Bern on your subject. And as I said to Stuart, I... Uh, We'll try to keep to the time. So if you do have a chance for questions at the end of the sort of 35 minute piece, we can do so. If not, we can deal with them in the chat later on. Uh, Brother Joseph Wages, over to you, sir. Oh, thank you very much for having me on again this morning. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Press that one. And let me know when we're good. That's your screen up, Joe. You're rather quiet, however. Oh, am I too quiet? Yeah, that, that was slightly better. Thank you. I'll just speak louder then. <laughs> okay. Well, brethren, thank you so much for allowing me to come speak to you today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the Order of the Golden Rosy Cross. So kind of just to put some boundaries on it, what we're not talking about are the is the original uh, Rosicrucian stuff from the Fama Fraternitatis and all these things from the 17th century. This is quite a bit later, you know, starting somewhere in the 1750s. But the interesting point of this whole thing is that we really don't know, if I get my mouse, where are you hiding over here? What we don't know is much about uh, the origins of the system itself. And what, and what do I mean exactly? We really don't even know when the order was founded, uh, what the purpose of the order was, and who the members were. And much like the Illuminati, um, there were order names that were used inside of it, and we don't really have much exposed material on this. We have scant clues in printed text. Uh, Boda, for instance, publishes uh, an expose on it. And interestingly enough, what I've ended up locating were Boda's original collection of materials, and then also using other materials that are elsewhere about the world, we're able to kind of reconstruct what this order looks like. Um, but like I said, we, there's a great deal about it we don't know. And so what we're going to talk about today is really like a work in progress. So I'm going to bring you up to speed where I'm at today as far as what we know conclusively about the rituals of this system. What we do know. Well, what we know about the Order of the Golden Rosy Cross, we do know what the degrees are. Um, there was a book published in 1925 uh, by Dr. Bernard Beyer. Um, and what he ended up doing was he took all the text. He was the archivist for the uh, Secret State Archives in Berlin in the uh, 1920s. So this is uh, pre-Nazi times. Um, and he took from the different manuscripts in his collection and kind of put his book together. And I know there's uh, another a uh, couple of individuals that are looking to translate these rituals, I might approach them with caution about this because when you actually see what the materials he worked with and then what he injected into it, it's not quite as clear. So he has fragmentary pieces of evidence that he ends up putting together in this book. And it's not to fault him. He's working with the extant materials he has available, but what he doesn't have is a complete ritual book. So just kind of recapping on these uh, degrees, uh, you've got uh, the first degree is Juniorius, the second degree is Theoricus, third degree is Practicus, fourth degree is Philosophist, uh, fifth degree is Adeptus Minor, the sixth degree is Adeptus Major, seventh degree Adeptus Exemptus, the eighth degree Magister, and the ninth degree Magus. And just to kind of 
make a statement um, in Byer's book, he, he, what he believes are the ninth degree materials. Uh, Reinhardt, my partner on the Secret School of Wisdom, uh, followed this trail to a, 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 a document that's supposed to be in the closed archives and come to find out that it's not the ninth degree at all. And in fact, um, when you read the whole text, it's actually against Rosicrucianism. So th this is what I'm talking about, where if we rely too heavily on the work of other people, instead of doing pioneering work, uh, you know, doing research, seeking out primary sources, it leads us to error and aberrant conclusions. And so what I'm doing here in this presentation and what I'm doing in general is uh, trying to reconstruct the, the order itself uh, based on the actual primary source evidence. That said, though, it's believed that Herman Fichtel is the uh, founder of the Golden Rosy Cross. But unfortunately, Herman Fichtel is a, is a pseudonym. We don't really know who this person was. However, in his uh, 1753 book, and again, it's a pen name, there's a cipher at the very end of this text. I don't know if you can see on the right-hand side there. It's encoded. Well, interestingly enough, uh, people have tried cracking at this cipher, um, and they've had some success. And so what I, where I think they made a mistake, though, is that they assumed that all the, correct, the characters are correct and that um, it was... It was it was done with, with proper rigor, and the thing is, because it's a it's a substitution cipher, and it could be in a manuscript. When you turn in a manuscript to a publisher to publish, uh, it's not like the 18th century publishing. You're actually moving pieces of block uh, to, to to do this, and so making changes isn't something that really happens. And also, if you look at it's an cipher text, um, what you're likely to come up with in the conclusions is that. Um, if you're, if you're trying to do quality control work on it, you, there's gonna be mistakes. And so I'm saying all this because uh, anytime you're looking at any type of printed material or any type of ciphered material, there's high probability for errors in the ciphers themselves. And in fact, all the different systems that I've studied um, that it contains ciphers, the members generally make mistakes. And so you wanna, you wanna, you wanna look at it closely uh, and so, kind of looking at how the cipher works it's a simple substitution cipher and it's rather easy to break um, however uh, you need to also take into account that some of the words were enciphered in, or some of the letters were enciphered incorrectly and so what i've done is i've cleaned it up a little bit um, and what we end up seeing is that um, it's saying that the, the author of that book is johann ferdinand von meinstor von meinstor von Salzstein. Uh, the salt signs a, is a joke. It's salt stone, but it's it's Johann Ferdinand von Meinstorf, who was a, a baron in Germany. Now, that's who the author of this book is. Does that mean that he's the founder of the system? We can't say with certainty. And the reason why people lean on this is that they see this text. Here's something else that we know. We now know generally what the regalia looked like, at least as far as the 1770s go. And what we see here, um, it's interesting. This was uh, published in Klaus Betog and Jan Snook's book that they were doing on the Scots master itself. I don't think that they had realized what these actually were. And so what you're seeing, and funny, it goes right to left in this particular image, but as we'll see in the next one, it's gonna go from left to right. <clears throat> what we're seeing is we're seeing what the regalia look like, at least as far as the 1770s go and it may not be the original regalia. And we'll, we'll talk about that more here in a minute. So just to give you an idea. So here's the, uh, the, the degrees from five to nine. And what's interesting is the aprons change from all black aprons, and then they start becoming more ornate as it kind of goes along. So getting more specifically into what it is that we know we're gonna take a look and I'm gonna show you some images from the pages of these texts. It, it works a little bit better this way because it, breaking down the entire system itself, um, that's gonna be very tiresome and you can't do it in 40 minutes. Um, but what we are going to do is generally uh, just kind of talk and look at some of these different texts. And I wanna show you some of the uh, problems and uh, challenges that we're overcoming. Um, and also we'll kind of change the way that we study this material, I believe based on this work. So this particular manuscript was constructed for the use in Hungary 
Um, and it says 1763 in the text. I believe this is actually uh, about 1768. Um, however, that's it's it's a copy of an official text. So it's the official ritual constructed for 1763. And so if we saw in that previous book, 1753 versus 1763, perhaps it's in work in the 1750s, if indeed that is the author of this system, but we can't be certain. It's all speculation at this point. But what I do find interesting is that you've got a 10 year gap from the publication of that book to this ritual. Also, I don't really see any references in uh, from the other German systems that I've studied about the Rosicrucians, whether it be you know, tangent generally through uh, correspondence. I don't see any of these uh, references, and it, but I do start seeing them in the 1760s. So it could be that the order wasn't found in the 1750s at all and that that book is not connected. Um, we just don't know. More research needs to be done. Uh, but based on the pieces I've seen so far, I'm not certain that we can conclusively say anything about it. But what we can say something conclusively about is this manuscript. Um, this comes from the uh, Masonic collection of uh, the last head of the Illuminati, Johann Joachim Christoph von Bode. And Bode uh, was a very large collector. And fortunately, um, I've been able to locate his archive where it's at. And it's probably one of the most important Masonic collections that are out there. Uh, but he was a collector of all systems. He has things going back to the 1730s and covering most of the uh, exit systems in the 18th century at the time. And this is yet one of those manuscripts that comes from this collection. So to kind of show you a little deeper peek inside here, um, I've highlighted for you where it says 5763. And so he has uh, 5623 on the left, 5693. So they're, what they're saying is that there were three main conventions that were held in 1623, 1693, and 1763. Um, I think the 1763 date is real. I think this, the 1623 date is uh, is referring back to, it's not, the, I think it's the, the Confessio is the publication date for this document. And so what they're trying to do is show some kind of connection back to the 17th century uh, Rosicrucian manifestos but of course that doesn't really seem to be the case. So if you're gonna go all the way back, you have to have some kind of intermediate date. And I think that's where 1693 falls in here. And so what it is, it's, it's them appearing to be a more ancient system that connects to the original. Uh, interestingly, like when in the uh, Confessio and the Fama, uh, there's uh, 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 Johann Valentin von Andre uh, was the, I forget which one he was the author of, but what's funny enough is he, he actually condemned some of these other systems and saying that, you know, they're used by con men and fraudsters. And that's probably the idea because people are looking for this mythical brotherhood that maybe only exists in paper and maybe only exists in the, in the initiate's heart. And it's a self-initiatic type process. Um, but interestingly enough, one of the, the authors of one of the early pieces like that condemns the works of others to try to, to say that it's an existing system. So just more supporting evidence here. So in any case, this particular uh, 1763 manuscript is the only one that I know of that has uh, a complete thing of rituals from the first degree through the eighth degree. And then there, of course, there's that elusive ninth degree we'll kind of brush on to here later. So just for proof, this is uh, the first degree text where it starts in the manuscript. Also inside this manuscript, there's a first degree tracing board and we'll see this reinforced later on. And then what we come to is the uh, second degree. And on the left over there in that first degree, they had uh, all the different alchemical system or uh, symbols and they list it out. And so um, what my impression is of these rituals in this system is they're very, very um, light on ritual and very heavy on study. And so in my point of view, it looks that the uh, Golden Rosy Cross had very little to do with Freemasonry at all. And in fact, the only time that any kind of Masonic things are mentioned is in that first degree text. And they give you a kind of like a, a counter explanation <clears throat> pardon me, uh, for what the uh, Masonic symbols mean and what, what they all do. And of course, in this system, they connected all to alchemy. So in this early form of the system, 
it's not a Masonic system at all, but what it does require is membership, uh, being a master Mason to be accepted into it. And basically once you cross the threshold, that's where Freemasonry ends and Rosicrucianism begins is, is generally the idea. So what we're looking at primarily is a operative system, maybe with a little bit of magic on the top, but only in the last degree in the ninth degree. So we're looking basically at a operative alchemical system. So kind of moving along here, we've also got uh, the initiation into the third degree and its uh, instruction text. And we also have the fourth degree. In that fourth degree text, there's actually some really interesting illustrations. Uh, and so it says that it's the symbol of the of the philosophy of the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms is the fourth class. And so that's kind of a neat little illustration that's in this manuscript. Also, um, just a, a general comment about the manuscript. It's really, really high quality. Um, and it probably was not cheap to make. Uh, just looking at the artwork in it and also the uh, penmanship in it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a top level uh, transcription job. So it probably was not an expensive or it wasn't a cheap text to copy. And then we see in yet another diagram in here um, where it says on the top, on the top left, it says God. On the top right, it says eternity. On the bottom, it says man, and on the bottom right, it says time. So it's it's showing like the uh, the way that basically it's all it is structured. So you have like the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is eternal versus the kingdom of man, and the and the kingdom of man is finite. It's generally what they're going with here. Then we see uh, of the instructions for preparing the uh, mineral stone. Um, this is really fantastic too. We got yet another watercolor uh, text that's in here. And kind of continuing along here, we've got yet another fantastic illustration in this fourth degree. Uh, pay attention to that cross up there. We'll come back to it later. Um, and what it is, it's actually showing you the uh, jewel that they would wear on their on their breast. So in this early form of uh, the Golden Rosy Cross, there's no Masonic regalia or connection. That does come in later, but in a subsequent reform. Then interestingly, we get another illustration here. So what they're showing you on this table is what, it, what the uh, reception uh, for that fourth degree looks like. Also, we see in this fourth degree that they have a cipher in place here. And these characters that are used in this fourth degree in the later forms of it, the cipher gets changed. And the same is this is the story for uh, the cipher in the first degree. Now I didn't include it in this one because it doesn't give a key for the cipher, but it's a really plain text key. So like if A equals one, B equals two, C equals three and so forth. And they use a 24, not a 26 character system. So they're using Latin alphabet uh, for the basis of all these ciphers. So I becomes J and W becomes B. And that's how you go from 26 to 24 characters. Interestingly, in this text, though, um, what they give for the for the initiations into the fifth, the sixth and the seventh degree, it gives the same form of initiation um, with slight changes. And it notes what the changes are between this ceremony in the fifth, sixth and seventh degree. But really what the fifth, sixth and seventh degree are is uh, like the rest of the system, very light on initiation and very heavy on study. But they did give us one neat little thing here. They, they show us what the regalia looks like for that seventh degree. We also have an eighth degree text in here. Um, so it, basically, um, we now have definitively, whereas Bayer speculated and kind of glued a series of manuscripts together into a form, um, now having looked at this particular text and uh, several examples from the 1770s and 1780s, what Bayer did was he took uh, different texts from different time periods and put them together. And it's good because he had, uh, you know, he had examples to kind of glue together. The problem is, though, the context is lost. So what we really see 
is uh, a system that kind of is glued together from its different parts and pieces, but you can't call it a, a pure system. So this text is all degrees one through eight, and it, it's actually put together for the first time uh, can, like in, in its own uh, in its own time period. So we have a, a great reference text here. And, you know, thankfully for us too, it's one of the early texts. So now we have a baseline of roughly when the system is and using this text, we can use it to, uh, to kind of put like a, a beginning point for the Golden Rosy Cross. And it may not be that it's the 1750s. It may be that it's the 1760s, or it could be that it is the 1750s but uh, this system doesn't formally get codified until 1763. We just don't know. However, in the very bottom of this manuscript, there's a clue to the identity of who, uh, who is the uh, person signing this text. Now note that the text, the, the handwriting and the seal there that you see on your screen are not the same handwriting as the scribe above. You know, thankfully, when you look at, uh, you know, contemporary sources, you were able to take the name uh, Victor Inakinis uh, or of Orso Lucius. Um, it turns out that his name is Hans Karl von Ecker und Eckhoffen. When we look, so who is Hans Karl von Ecker von Eckhoffen? Uh, he was born December the 26th, 1760 or 1754 in Munich. Uh, so clearly he's not the founder. Um, that's too late for this period. Um, he dies in June 22nd, 1809 in Bamberg, Germany with an assumed aristocratic title. So he's not really a noble. He just calls himself one. Um, he's a lawyer and an author and uh, like his brother Hans Heinrich, uh, a very active Freemason and Masonic writer. And so uh, Hans Karl is basically kind of following in the footsteps of his brother. His brother is the main source here uh, for, uh, you know, being a Masonic power and a creator of sorts. So let's talk about his brother, Hans Heinrich von Ecker and Eckhofen. Uh, he was born August the 1st, 1750, so he's the older brother. Uh, but he dies in August the 14th, 1790 in Brunswick, Germany with an assumed aristocratic title. Um, and he's also a member uh, later of the Polish Privy Council. He's an active Freemason and Masonic writer. More importantly, though, he founded the Order of Knights and Brothers of Light in Vienna in 1781. Um, and it admitted Jewish brethren to the great controversy of, you know, other Masons in the system. So in Germany at this point in time, uh, Jews were not allowed to be made Freemasons. It just, it was the policy. Uh, interestingly, the Illuminati, they repeated that same, uh, you know, the same prohibition. However, they did have several Jewish brethren, um, and it was mainly uh, Friedrich Nikolai was one of the ones where he was a printer, so he was very useful, and he really wasn't what you call a, a practicing Jew per se. He was more of a deist, much like the membership of the Illuminati. Um, in any case, uh, his admitting Jewish brethren to it uh, mainly is because of his interest in Kabbalah that causes him quite a bit of controversy uh, with the Rosicrucians. So remember, he's a member of the Rosicrucian order. Then he founds the uh, Order of Knights and Brothers of Light in Vienna, right? So he's likely drawing on their materials. So the controversy may, in fact, be less to do with that they admitted Jewish brethren and more to do with the fact that he's working from their source materials to create his own system. So basically, he's gone uh, clandestine with respect to their uh, system itself. So that system ultimately fails the same year that it's created. Uh, and he's forced to leave Vienna and he goes to Berlin. And in Berlin, he founds the Order of Knights and Brothers of St. John the Evangelist from Asia and Europe, or what we know as the Asiatic Brethren. Um, in 1782, interestingly, Eckhoffhoven was able to win the leading Freemason Karl von Hesse Darmstadt uh, for himself at the Convention of Wilhelmsbad and reworked the system at his request. So he gains a very influential Freemason uh, into, his, uh, into his Asiatic Brethren system. And fortunately, Boda also has this system. It's someone I'll do in the future, but I want to get some of the bigger fish fried here first. <clears throat> So we've mentioned the two brothers, but wait, there's more. We've got uh, Ludwig Felix Johann Nepomuk Freiherr von Ecker von Eckhofen, and uh, he's born in 1757 in Munich, so he's the youngest one. 
and he also dies there in 1826. Six. He's a member of the court and censorship councils, but more importantly, he's a member of the Munich Illuminati Lodge, St. Theodore of Good Council. So this is the lodge the Illuminati starts in Munich. Um, they end up buying a lodge house that's their, their meeting place in Munich, and his order name is Pericles. And using this connection, so we have the connection all the way to the manuscript, so it's his brother, in fact, who gave, who gave this uh, 1763 ritual book to Boda. And so what I believe happens is, is that these texts are revised, this text becomes redundant because it's no longer used anymore. And that's likely the transmission to Boda himself. So now we, in addition to having a complete ritual book, we've got a likely chain of succession for the manuscript. Uh, so that's actually really important and it kind of you know adds to the details here. <laughs> But let's talk about a reform that happens in 1777. Our brother Stuart here was kind enough to share with me some files that are in Sydney, um, and it jives with some of the other manuscripts that I've got from uh, Sweden and some of the ones I have from the Netherlands and Denmark as well. And so what we're looking at then is a reform of that system. And just to not go too deep into the weeds here, the general reform that happens here are more Masonic elements are now being added into this system. And so what we're seeing is it go from a purely operative alchemical system that dabbles slightly in magic and not in the top parts of it um, to a, a more of a quasi Masonic system. So whereas before you had to be a Freemason to join, now they're starting to put in a little bit more Masonic elements to make the system interesting. Uh, one of the interesting things that's inside here is you see it gives you the old cipher. So the cipher above where it looks like numbers, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, and six. If you look at it, it's actually, it's, you know, it looks, it looks like a cipher character, but it's really not. It's actually the numbers. And that was the original cipher. And what they're showing you is the revised cipher. And so because that cipher, you know, you, you can look at it, you can crack it. They wanted to get something slightly more uh, secure. And so what they end up doing is changing the characters in it. So what we see above is here is the cipher system from before, from 1760 up to 1777. And now under our new order reform plan of 1777, here's what the new first degree cipher looks like. So let's talk about that order reform plan of 1777. This chart is very interesting. If you'll see the uh, series of crosses there, those are the uh, the uh, actual uh, you know order jewels that you're going to wear on your neck, like in your assemblies. Um, and interestingly, if uh, I'll tell you what, we'll go ahead and we'll skip to the next one. You'll see that for that ninth degree on the top. So um, you'll see the numbers 19, 28, 37, 46, 55, 64, 73, 82, and 91 very interesting because um, look at the numbers like split the draw line between the characters and you see you see one through nine on the left and then if you look on the right it's one through nine in reverse and so that's what those numbers mean um, and they're, they're, they're just showing like what the degree is so from the top down point of view the ninth degree is the first degree but from a bottom up point of view the first degree is uh, juniorius um, in any case it, it shows you what the uh, the degree name, its position is, the jewel that they wear, and for the uh, ninth degree, the magus, it says that they wear the Urim and the Thummim. Uh, so that's actually quite interesting. What we do see also are examples of the ciphers uh, for each text here. And what I'd also like to point out too is that the second degree and third degree cipher are the same cipher. Um, Let's kind of move on here. So now we're looking at the uh, seal of the Weimar uh, Golden Rosy Cross Circle, uh, Hegrologina. Uh, um, so that's actually not a person's name. That's the name of the circle of uh, Rosicrucians in Weimar. And that's what, what that is. And so it's the secretary. We also have in that same manuscript uh, what the first degree reception looks like. And if you'll remember from that 1763 book, we saw that tracing board, same thing again, where that tracing board's now in use here and slightly changed a little bit, but for the most part, it's keeping with the same. And they were just kind enough to illustrate what a first degree reception looks like for us. 
So this is from the second degree cipher. So what they're showing you is uh, if you have characters A, 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 E. So for A, E in German, that would be A with an umlaut. And so what they're showing you is you put one little tick above the cross. If it's AI, it's two ticks. If it's AO, uh, then you put two little ticks on the bottom and AU, one little tick on the bottom of that cross. And that's all they're showing you here. Um, and we'll get more into the ciphers in just a minute. Um, those are quite interesting, like how they actually evolve. What we also have is a third and final form that, that differs yet again from the 1777. So we've got somewhere in the 1780s a revision of the ritual text themselves. And even this is the first three degrees that cipher changes yet again into slightly something more different here. So now let's dive a little bit more into the ciphers themselves. So Bodo was a huge uh, uh, cipher collector and for cryptography, and I've used it on more than one occasion, his cipher collection uh, to break ciphers that you that we don't have keys to. And it's, it's, it's a pretty neat little thing. So what we see is this is uh, someone who's received the first degree. So it looks like after someone's reception in the first degree, the lodge gave him or the assembly gave him a key of how to use the cipher itself. So this is really neat because you have a personal effect from someone who was received. And if you see how it's kind of folded up, you, you can see how it was folded and handed to him. So that way he knows um, what the cipher is. And much along the same lines here, um, you see that same cipher before. So you see the old cipher on top of one through 24 cipher. Um, then you also see the later one. So we can now, based on that 1770 manuscript, knowing that it's a reform plan, that's a, it's kind of a hard stop there in the evolution. Uh, we now know what those two ciphers look like here. And there's yet another cipher in here. This one's quite interesting. Um, what we see is uh, the first degree cipher above. And then what we also see below it are the second and third degree ciphers. Uh, if, if you'll just kind of maybe go back and look at that other one here in a minute, I'm not sure that we have time. Um, the second and third degree ciphers, it's literally the same text. So if you look at what they're doing, uh, say for instance, A, A to the cross at the top one of the first degree and the second and third degree, they're using A, but they're using little squiggly characters. Um, so it's, 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 they're using the same cipher, it just looks materially different, but it's not different at all. that they were the Urim and the Thummim on their breast, right? right? They're actually constructing the Urim and the Thummim. So to kind of put it all together um, in the text, like when it talks about how to prepare this thing, really what I think the purpose of the Golden Rosy Cross system is, is they were learning these different alchemical operations. And for that top and final degree is for preparation to have the skills necessary to construct the Urim and the Thummim. That's roughly what I think this thing is. So I need to kind of put a bow on this thing right now. So let's kind of go back and review what we've learned so far. We've learned that actually we know very little about the founding of the order. We also know very little about the membership. But however, we now know that the we know now know the rituals and some of the organizational documents of the order. So within the within the rituals, there's instruction text, but it's probably not all of them. And there's probably more, and there's probably three forms of them too. But we also know that there's at least three forms of rituals. So in, in conclusion, um, hopefully we're 
setting the stage here for more research onto this system itself. But what my goal is, is to take all three forms of the ritual from the maybe 18 or 19 manuscripts that I have, consolidate them into one text and then present it to you. So where I'm at now is I've got 1763 done and we're plowing away into 1777. It's probably uh, you know a couple of years out from being ready for a book. Well, with, for that, brethren, I'm through, and I will yield back for questions if we have enough time. Brother Joe Wages, thank you very much. I, that was very interesting and very enlightening. Brian, I think one of the, if there is any silver linings to do with the, the global COVID-19 pandemic, is that particularly across Freemasonry, we're meeting new Brian from all parts of the globe that can come to us and speak to us. And I met you over the last six months due to Zoom and the pandemic and Freemasonry and it's a pleasure to have you with us again this evening and maybe one day uh, either here in Scotland Joe or if I ever get back to, to Texas we'll meet in a lodge together so we do have a question for you though uh, From Martin Fox, one of our other speakers, Joe, can I ask if the tracing board was some form uh, of tracing board or what form of the tracing board took? I think I saw one too about a memory wheel, but maybe I'm jumping ahead here. Um, so it looks like it's a magical circle to me is what it looks like. Your volume is very low again, Joe, sorry. Oh, sorry, I, I think it looks like a, uh, I'm not sure that it's a memory wheel, it looks more like a magic circle to me but it doesn't really describe in the ritual what it is. Um, the, the letters that are on there, you can figure out what they mean from the text, but to me, it looks like a quasi uh, magic circle, even though there's no magical operations being performed in this text. So it, short answer is I really don't know, but I think it looks kind of like a pseudo uh, magic circle. Oh, okay, it's, it's very low, Joe. I, I think, Joe, if you're able to put the answer to that question in the chat, that would be appreciated uh, at some point this afternoon. Uh, and the, the other question that we've got, and again, I'll ask you to put the answer in the chat because of your volume. Uh, excellent presentation, says Jedediah French. They made their own uh, Uram and Thuman. Looks like a magic mirror. What did they do with it? Oracle asking evocation. So again, if you could look to put uh, the answer into the, the chat, that would be very much appreciated. Joe, once again, on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi, thank you once again for giving up your valuable time to join us here this afternoon. And as I said to Stuart, I hope you can stay with us for the rest of our presenters this afternoon. And uh, we're doing well, Brian, we're, we're spot on time. Uh, so it gives me the greatest of pleasure to move on to our third speaker of the afternoon. Uh, again, another brother that I, I've met for or, or have known over the last 10 years or so, uh, brother Ian Robertson. Uh, brother Robertson joined the craft in 1988 and has since joined many other orders, including chapter KT's Royal Order of Scotland to name but a few. He's a past master of, Saint, of Lodge St. Kentigern, 4 to 9, uh, across in Edinburgh Shire, and he's currently the Supreme Magus of the Societas Rosicruciana in Scotia. Uh, so to me, that he means he, he's the, the head Rosicrucian in Scotland. Uh, out with the craft, he's also a, a very uh, important person, I would say, in Edinburgh's civic life, He as he is the 350th Deacon Convener of the Incorporated Trades of Edinburgh, and that makes him the third uh, citizen of our great capital city. Uh, he's a Deacon of the Incorporation of Candlemakers, Vice President of the Burgess Association of Edinburgh, and Assistant Director of Ceremonies for the Venerable Order of St John in Scotland, where he holds the grade of Commander. As we know, he is also a published author and lecturer. Brother Ian Robertson, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, and I now give the floor over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Brother Gordon, and, and to the previous speakers as well, uh, Stuart and Joe, uh, absolutely fantastic. Now, brethren, uh, I hope it's okay uh, with yourselves, but I've not put a PowerPoint together. I've got um, sort of like a bit of a mind map here, um, because I kind of thought uh, for me, a PowerPoint would be kind of quite prescriptive. 
I did not know what Stuart was going to present, nor um, Joe, uh, apart from the titles. So I thought I'd be a bit more free flowing to, to, to maybe put some things in context for, for maybe some brethren that aren't so familiar with some of the terms, um, but also to place Scotland, as, as I see it, rightly in the, the, the centre of uh, these themes that we're exploring this afternoon, or, or to describe where Rosicrucianism um, in particular and, and Freemasonry um, evolved and developed within Scotland, arguably Rosicrucian themes um, influencing what becomes the Scottish craft and, and therefore influencing Freemasonry worldwide. So um, as, as Gordon shared, I, I joined the craft in 1988. I also joined the Theosophical Society in 1988. And, and probably strangely for the uh, past masters and office bearers that um, sat on my inquiry committee, when they asked the question, Mr. Robertson, why do you want to be a Freemason? My answer was, I'm interested in esoteric philosophies. Now I could see some twitching in the ranks. What, what's this guy on about? <laughs> so I had read about some of the themes that have been discussed already and, and truly, I believe that in the craft, um, there's so much more than any of us realise, and it, it really is a lifetime pursuit. Um, as we're told, it's a peculiar system of morality, veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. And we hear from our traditional histories that aren't actual factual histories, but more signposts to, to deeper study, I, I really think is what it's about. It was interesting that Joe mentioned in the uh, golden, um, the the German uh, Golden and Rosy Cross, that it was light on ritual, but heavy on study. Do you know, brethren, if I'm honest, I think, you know, we, we, we probably put too much into uh, focusing on ritual to find illumination when really the craft and, and all these other bodies are signposts. I think it was Stuart mentioned that, you know, rather than dogmatism, it's, it's your journey, it's your life, and it's very much a personal journey to go on. So re really what I want to share in the, the time that I've got, and I'll do my best to stay on time, is to, to share some of my uh, personal journey and some of what I've gleaned along the way. And I'll make reference to um, Rosicrucianism in particular. Um, joined the craft in 88, 1988, and I became a member of Metropolitan College of the Societas Rosicruciana in Scotia, which technically is not Masonic, but you need to be a Freemason to join. I joined that in 1993, and within the first couple of years, I really thought, wow, this is what I'm looking for in terms of esoteric papers. After each meeting, it, it is um, strongly suggested that there should be a paper on an esoteric topic. And one of the people that really, really, really impressed me, um, sadly no longer with us, the Reverend Hugh Mackay of Tulmain. <laughs> now I think he was a uh, deputy Grand Master Mason uh, back in the day, <clears throat> in the late 80s, early 90s. And he, he, he was a Church of Scotland minister who was giving a talk on um, the symbolism of the tarot deck that was used by many members of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. I thought, wow, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. So back, back then, that, that really set me on a journey. I had also um, very much uh, looked into, as many of you know, the St. Clair family and their involvement in Freemasonry, places like Roslyn, but the history of Freemasonry in general, but Scottish Freemasonry in particular. And if you read many of the um, very reliable works, you know, like uh, Murray Lyne, who was also a Rosicrucian, um, they do make references, Gould and, and, and many of the other um, important works will talk about um, the Rosicrucian fraternity. Um, so, that really kind of set me on a journey. And I, I don't know if it's synchronicity, um, but I do find myself in the position now as Supreme Magus of the society in Scotland. So um, more and more, I feel that I, I, I do need to find out more about this and, and really understand it more. 
Um, recently, I, I, I see Charles is on the call, um, who, who's involved in the um, History and Heritage uh, Group um, under Grand Lodge. Um, we, we, we are both members of Lodge Sir Robert Murray, where we're currently involved in a project looking at um, this period in time that Sir Robert Murray uh, lived, lived through and, and some of the influences. So I'll, I'll share that with you um, this afternoon, brethren, some of where we're at. I've always been interested, I, I, I kind of, a bit like today, I, I like to see things on one page to try and make sense of where, where does this fit in, what came first, what came next, and what does it mean for us now? So, so really, my timeline that I looked at was uh, considering things like Freemasonry started with the building of the pyramids. Sounds a little bit fanciful. Um, the, the original Freemasons were the builders of Solomon's Temple. Again, I find that's a bit of a stretch because we're not talking about a physical temple. We're talking about the spiritualized temple of Solomon. So looking down through the ages, truly the 18th century, um, which Joe referenced with that particular order, the 18th century has been known as the age of Freemasonry, um, the age of enlightenment, and, and these go hand in hand. But before that, the, the preceding century is extremely interesting, certainly for us as Scottish Freemasons. We have right at the beginning, 1590, 1599, we have the Shaw Statutes. And as we go into the 17th century, we have the foundation documents appearing in Europe um, for what becomes known as the uh, Rosicrucian <coughs> Society. Um, Joe made reference to these, the Fama Fraternitatis, or the, the fame of the fraternity was published in 1614. The following year, the Confessio Fraternitatis, the confessions of this mystical fraternity appear. And then the following year again, the Chemical Wedding, um, which is a very strange and very interesting document. Thereafter, many writers, uh, people like Robert Flood um, and many European writers speak about the existence of a fraternity that's with us now. All of this is well to put into context. Um, Europe has gone through so many upheavals and indeed today, you know, just part of the ongoing of things, things continue to change. But the changes that were happening in the 17th century were, uh, well, before that, even in the 16th century, we have um, reforms, um, the age of reformation, um, then moving into things like the age of reason and, and the um, enlightenment. But it's the 17th century for me that's a real melting pot of ideas where we have the Shaw Statutes, which in Scotland we take as uh, foundation documents really for us. And by the end of that century, we, we, we begin to see rituals which are not too unfamiliar to us today as Freemasonic rituals. Um, the Edinburgh Register House, uh, 1696 in particular, that mentions the Mason's word. You're probably all familiar as well that the much, much quoted Scottish poem by Henry Adamson of Perth, 1638, talks about, uh, we are the brethren of the rosy cross. We have the Mason's word and the gift of second sight. Now that's extremely interesting because in 1638, Henry Adamson was dead. So we know it was written before that point in time. He died in uh, 1637. It was William Drummond of Hawthornden, just along the road from Roslyn, who had, um, basically been the, the, the patron of this work and, and saw it published in Edinburgh in 1638. So it's earlier, and, and I'll come back to that shortly about um, how these influences from the continent come to Scotland and the part that Germany plays in particular. Now, I, th I think, you know, our thoughts on Germany have obviously been influenced over the century um, significantly in, in the 20th century by two world wars. Prior to that, the Hanseatic League and Scotland, um, so Scotland uniquely, not, not thinking necessarily about the United Kingdom, but Scotland as a nation in its own right, 
uh, dealing very much with places like France and the Old Alliance, the Low Countries and Scandinavia and Germany. We had very, very close links with Germany, philosophically as well as uh, scientifically, uh, technologically, and in, in terms of the Reformation, um, theologically as, as well. So let me backtrack a little bit. Um, for anybody that's not familiar with the story of uh, the foundation story of the Rosicrucians, it starts off with uh, a young man, a German noble, who is referred to as Christian Rosenkrauz. He's supposed to have lived between the years 1378 and 1484. Now he travels to the Middle East and there he, he finds out many things. He learns many, many mysterious things about healing the sick and some of the more spiritual um, traditions. Uh, some people have argued that he perhaps met with um, Sufi mystics. Certainly mysticism is a theme that comes through Rosicrucianism, um, Christian mysticism, obviously, in particular. Now, the story goes that he comes back to Germany uh, ready to share with the um, uh, royal courts of Europe this wonderful transformative um, information that he's discovered. But he feels that Europe's very much stuck in the mundane with, um, I was going to say petty squabbles, bigger than that, because wars and division and, and not right ready for, for this kind of information. So the story goes in the foundation myth that he forms a secret brotherhood where they will all go out to different countries, they will be unknowns and they will live amongst us, but without ego, without letting themselves be known. But they'll, they'll do good deeds because they can and that for free gratis. So helping people, healing people. Now today that's, I'd, I'd say, as pertinent now as it's ever been. Um, and not just physical ailments. You know, we hear today that the impact of COVID on people's mental health and well-being is massive. Um, so that need for us all to be um, serviceable to our fellow creatures has never been more predominant within the craft, I would argue. And some of the some of the things that brethren have done have been absolutely phenomenal. You know. Um, um, delivering food parcels to the vulnerable and, and, and really the charitable works uh, by giving of themselves, which, which is um, absolutely massive. Anyway, back to our story. Um, Christian Rosenkrauz, in fact, uh, Martin this afternoon will tell us more about, about the tomb that's discovered. So I won't say too much about it. I'll, 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 I'll leave that for Martin to explain. But it's, it's a tremendous story. Um, and, and the year 1604, the discovery of uh, the tomb of Christian Rosenkrantz is interesting when we begin to take some of these dates and bring it back into the context of Scotland. Just before that, um, I'll, I'll talk through some of the people that influenced what became the Rosicrucian movement and influenced some of the thinking contained within these pamphlets that comes out early in the 17th century most of them German, I have to say. Um, I'll start with an Italian. Um, correct my pronunciation, Stuart, if I get this wrong. Pico della Mirandola. Um, fascinating chap who um, believed that he had drawn from all the ancient traditions, distilled them into 900 most important principles that proved Christianity as, as the key faith. Um, he was very influential on a young man called Johann Recklin, uh, who influenced uh, Martin Luther. Now, Johann Recklin was the first person that took Jewish Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, but put it into a Christian context. So um, he's seen as, as a, a great force for what became Christian Kabbalah, which is core to Rosicrucianism. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is, um, as I say, he had a, an influence on Martin Luther. Um, Joe, Joe made reference to persecution of the Jews, but during the time of Martin Luther, um, where, as we see later on in, in German history, you know, the destruction of books, the persecution of Jews and Freemasons and, and others, 
At that point in time, Martin Luther was very supportive of the Jews and of Jewish mysticism in the form of Kabbalah. Thoughts on my own part are that as the reformed um, approaches were implemented across Europe, I think in some cases the baby was thrown out with the bathwater, which left an opportunity for fraternities like the Rosicrucians and Freemasonry to develop, where um, uh, some of these more spiritual traditions and um, Neoplatonic and Hermetic and, and dare I say, alchemical traditions uh, come through, um, not in a, an exoteric way, but part of the hidden stream within, within the craft. Some others that influenced what became uh, in, uh, involved in the pamphlets, the English mathematician and polymath and uh, mystic, John Dee, the original 007, who was um, at the court of uh, Elizabeth I of England, but he also traveled extensively across Europe um, um, and, and lived for um, a while in Prague, which was a real center for esoteric thinking. Uh, Paracelsus, um, he, he has an influence in one of the um, foundation documents, The Chemical Wedding. Uh, Paracelsus is, is kind of today seen as the, the father of uh, modern day homeopathic medicine. So he was a philosopher and a, and a physician. Um, what's the chap's name? Kunrath, Heinrich Kunrath is, is the person that takes some of these influences and brings Hermeticism, Christian Kabbalah, and themes like alchemy together. So he's really seen as a person that is massively influential in, in what we now know as the Rosicrucian movement. So I've shared that. Where, where, where does Scotland come into some of this then? Well, very interestingly, um, I'm sure there's more than this one family, but the Lindsay family um, uh, are uh, predominant within this. They had dealings um, with Nuremberg. Um, now it was in Nuremberg that Martin Luther and, and all, all, all this piece about um, uh, Ricklin and the Christian Kabbalah really, really kind of takes hold. Um, Edsel, the castle of Edsel, uh, belonging to the Lindsays, um, he, he had brought over some expertise from Nuremberg, from Germany, uh, two Germans who were helping him with his uh, mining, uh, minerals, look, looking for gold. Um, so there was definitely an influence there. In the walled garden, which dates 1604 at Edsel, we have some very interesting carvings, the seven liberal arts and sciences, the seven planetary deities and the seven virtues. And we know, in fact, you look up the um, proceedings of the Society of Antiquaries from, I think it's about 1930, um, the article on Edsel basically describes these carvings as being more or less copies from a book uh, that came from Nuremberg. But more than that, in the Lindsay family, they had um, a huge interest in Rosicrucianism and alchemy. Um, Frances Yates, that was mentioned earlier in, in her book, The um, Rosicrucian Enlightenment, um, she describes the Lindsays of Balcaris in Fife having a library which has many manuscripts, which includes a 1633 um, Scots translation of the Fama Fraternitatis. So this is quite early on, you know, this, this movement in Europe being um, of interest to uh, a noble family or more than one noble family here in Scotland. We know that the first Lord Balcaris was a great friend of William Shaw and actually advised him on some of the restorations at Holyrood Palace. So, so we know that these people were connected with the Scottish court. Um, 1598 and 1599, we know William Shaw was behind the Shaw statutes. And it said that Giordano Bruno, who was mentioned earlier, uh, an Italian, 
um, who was interested in Hermeticism, had an influence on the statues and brought in that Hermetic thinking of the art of memory, which, which Martin will tell us so much more about later. Bruno was burnt at stake in the year 1600. So brethren, this, this whole concept of, I was taught to be cautious and you don't reveal everything. You make sure that you do it within people who are trusted and known and who understand. So we begin to see a bit of a, a who's who amongst families and not things that are out there, so to speak. But we do know that Sir Robert Murray married Sophia, um, the, the daughter of one of the Lindsays. So um, 1641, um, known as one of the sort of like first speculative Freemasons, ahead five years ahead of uh, Elias Ashmole, who became a Freemason in, in 1646. Um, both of whom were very, very influential in, in what becomes the Royal Society. So very much focused on um, modernizing and science and technology, but with this undercurrent of um, spirituality and um, uh, seeking a wider knowledge than just the empirical um, systems that, that later develop. So a lot of that, um, I suppose, really interesting and the, the evolution of Freemasonry um, really being developed by families, noble families here in Scotland. We know, and, and we've heard this so many times, that the first Grand Lodge, um, 1717 England, we know that during the 18th century, Scotland went through many uh, turmoils uh, with our, with our neighbours. Um, so the continental influence becomes huge. So some of what goes out to the continent, arguably from Scotland and then comes back in and goes to places like um, the New World, uh, the, the, the Americas in particular, um, for me is really quite fascinating because there seems to be a bit of a silent period. There's, there's more of the exoteric, you know, the once upon a time we were stonemasons and then we evolved into Freemasons. But I think, I think, brethren, that's a bit too simplistic. It is, um, if we think about the builder's craft in a symbolic, in an allegorical, in, in, in that type of way, it's not Solomon's Temple, but the spiritualized version of Solomon's Temple. With the development of the Americas as well, this, this potential for a new world, for a new Jerusalem is, is very much with us. And even now in the 21st century, are we there yet? Absolutely not. You know, we need to be kinder, more compassionate and, and more supportive of our fellow creatures around the planet and, and not, um, not at variance. And I think these are great lessons that have come through the craft, you know, based on sort of like moral conduct and uprightness of character. But more than that, these traditions of um, mysticism, I, I would suggest, and even things as well like alchemy. When, when, when you look at some of these uh, amazing uh, alchemical um, drawings, which are full of information for those who understand and can read the symbols. I think they were really the precursor for what becomes our tracing boards, um, which are full of information for those that are initiated into a beginnings of understanding what they mean and the signposts that they are that, that, that take us through life. Back to Scotland again, some other bits to throw in. Um, James VI uh, was, um, by his own admission, according to Lodge School in Perth number three, made a Freemason around about 1601 before he becomes the king that unites the kingdoms in 1603. 1604, as I mentioned, is when um, uh, the tomb of Christian Rosencrantz is supposed to be rediscovered. And 10 years later, we have the pamphlets circulating across Europe. There was a, another German uh, alchemist who actually wrote to uh, King James. And in um, it was only discovered in 1993 in um, Register House here in Edinburgh. There's something that's referred to as the Rosicrucian Christmas card. 
1611 sent to the king of Great Britain now, but certainly a Stuart king, a Scottish king. And it's a beautiful design in the shape of a rose. So it's very much uh, yours under the rose. So this idea of sub rosa, that we don't share, share this information with everyone, but we have signs of recognition for um, brethren who are tried and trusted. A theme, I believe, again, that comes through in the craft. Um, this continental explosion um, is fascinating. If, if, if you look at um, one of what I would say, <laughs> one of the best um, Masonic resources, which is Coyle's Masonic Cyclopedia, um, American, but it's very good for separating, completely speculative, completely wrong, there's something in this. They actually describe the most problematic words in Freemasonry as Scots, Scottish, and Ecosse. Um, there are many uh, 18th century esoteric Masonic rituals that talk about um, St. Andrew, um, CBCS, um, Illuminati, and, and many others. So, you know, there's this signpost to Scotland, but we've still not properly bottomed it out. And what I'm suggesting uh, for further study, brethren, is this, this theme of um, Rosicrucianism, which is embraced in Scotland. As I mentioned, 1604, the Lindsay's at Edsel, um, 1633, we, we, we know that in a collection there are alchemical and Rosicrucian books. And by 1638, posthumously printed, we have those immortal lines of we are the brethren of the Rosy Cross, we have the gift of second sight in the Mason's word. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that that is the first time that we have mention of the Mason's word, which again appears in one of the very earliest, if not the earliest, truly Masonic ritual in the Edinburgh Register House manuscript. Just to kind of finish off, um, Robert Murray, um, we know that he was friendly with a man called Thomas Vaughan, who was the first person in English, certainly in Britain, to produce a printed version of the Fama Fraternitatis in 1652, based on the Bulcaris manuscript. So it's not necessarily just what you know, but who you know, so we can begin to see some of these links between people and between families. Not really sure what happens um, in the um, um, 18th century in terms of Rosicrucianism in Scotland in particular, but we, know, we do know in the 19th century that there is a group that forms in the 1850s in Edinburgh under a man called Anthony O'Neill Hay. Um, in our English counterparts, the Society of Rosicrucians in Anglia, in their collection, they actually have a notebook, a handwritten uh, notebook with um, part of a ritual from 1857. In Edinburgh in 1866, uh, two English brethren are initiated into the Rosicrucian system. Uh, a man called William Hewan and a man called Robert Wentworth Little. They go on to create the SRIA, the Society Rosicruciana in Anglia. And we, we know famously from esoteric and occult um, traditions that some of the members from the SRIA go on to create the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the most significant um, uh, body in the occult revival, certainly in the English speaking world. Um, I'll, I'll probably just finish up there, brethren, because I'm, I'm checking the time. I think we've got maybe 10 minutes for questions, but um, in, in terms of the society that I belong to today, we definitely take our birth from the earlier society here in Edinburgh, but it did transform and the SRIS took on a, a form of practice similar to the SRIA. Um, we also established uh, Rosicrucianism in America, uh, which is now the Societas Rosicruciana in Civitatibus 
Federatis. I, I always try to get my pronunciation of that right. Um, so worldwide Rosicrucianism today, um, I would say all has to sort of like take a nod to Scotland and Edinburgh. What happened in between the original Rosicrucian influences in Scotland though and this body um, is shrouded in mystery. We are researching as much as we can to try and find a link. We do know that the grade system is almost identical to the German and Golden Rosy Cross, but the rituals aren't. The, the very first grade though, uh, we, we call that a uh, zealotar, uh, rather than the jun jun juniors or, or whatever the term was, but all other grades are exactly the same as the Golden and Rosy Cross. And it was that structure that was picked up by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, where they put even more in terms of magic and mysticism, uh, going back to medieval grimoires. Um, we, we, we're certainly not as prescriptive as that. We are more, um, I suppose, inviting people to take some of the guiding principles and search for meaning in their own lives and their own understandings. I think I've covered most of what I wanted to cover today and I think I've got about nine minutes left Gordon so I'm happy if anybody's got any questions and if I can answer them I will if not I'll pass on the information to Gordon later to to get back to you on. Ian, brother Ian Robertson can I thank you in the same manner as I thank the previous two speakers for your efforts this afternoon. And we are all very grateful for your time today. I, again, I, my only comment is I think the, the nod that you made to Scotland and Edinburgh being the, the birthplace of Rosicrucianism, uh, it's always good to, to acknowledge that I believe, and I think many of us around the, the screen today believe that Scotland is the, the true birthplace of Freemasonry as well. And uh, just, we, just, just to qualify that, uh, the birthplace of modern day Rosicrucianism, not, not the original German fraternity, if, if it ever existed. Yeah, which, which which could could be mythical, but um, certainly the influences came out of Germany. Um, but what we have today worldwide is, mm -hmm. you know, stemmed from stemmed from Edinburgh. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions I see coming into the chat. Uh, Eric Brown mentions that the Americans have problems also pronouncing their name, so <laughs> you, you're not alone there, which is which is good. Uh, Alan Turton, one of our past masters here at Lodge Hope of Karachi, asks, Ian, have you looked at Francis Bacon, his links to D, secrecy, emblematica, and story pictures associated with tracing boards? I suppose the short answer is not in any great depth, uh, but there's a, there's a whole width of uh, material, you know, that we can look at. Some of, the, some of those um, early influence documents in the 17th century that really explode after after um, um, the pamphlets come out across Europe. Okay, thank you. A question from Donald Mackenzie. As membership numbers in Scottish Freemasonry uh, seem to have been in decline, would this also be the case for SRIS? Um, yes and no. Um, um, in fact, if I'm, if I'm being totally honest, I, 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 I am uh, actively working against uh, do you want a form without any explanation. I think that what we're looking for is quality rather than quantity. And I, I, I do believe that we're, we're finding a bit of a renaissance where we do have people that are genuinely interested in these subjects. And, and now, as you, as you mentioned earlier, Gordon, it's wonderful that um, we can connect with Joe in, in Texas there. Um, in fact, Demetrius, uh, I, I, I think, is on with us. Uh, I spoke to earlier a, a Rosicrucian group in Greece who met this morning our time. And uh, last night it was on to Tasmania. Um, last night our time, it was uh, um, morning time over there um, where, where, where we have a college. So the way in which we can connect now with like-minded um, uh, fratters, as we call them globally, is, is quite phenomenal. I think I think that is the only challenge of, uh, or one of the challenges with Zoom and being uh, head of a, a global Masonic order, 
uh, taking in times the, the time zones challenges and so your breakfast becomes your lunch becomes your tea or your supper uh, Ian McKenz Ian McIntosh uh, mentions to the Brennan it's worth taking a trip to Edsel Castle to see the wall plaques and the symbols up there uh, I do remember when I was serving in the Royal Air Force visiting RAF Edsel uh, back in the day uh, but they are no longer there either but yes I would agree with Ian Edsel Castle is well worth a visit and if you can't visit Brenwell, we can't during this time, but please have a Google and look at the Edsel Gar Ga Castle Gardens. Stephen Turner comments, although I understand that SRIS was chartered by SRIA, there is no doubt that had Little and Huon not been made Rosicrucians in Scotland, SRIA would not have existed. Well, chartered question mark because these guys were already established Rosicrucians, people like Laurie, who was Grand Secretary, people like Murray Lyne. Th there seems to have been a falling <coughs> out with Anthony O'Neill Hay and um, um, started to follow more of what was developing in Anglia. But even, even in Anglia, um, the earliest um, rituals that they have up to the ninth grade uh, were presented by members of the West of Scotland or Glasgow College. So... Um, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, well, and it's a little bit contentious. Um, Wentworth Little um, was a self-proclaimed Supreme Magus. I think today we'd call that a regular. <laughs> so so the, the, the seeds of the earlier society, the, the, the ritual, which is not the same, but the elements in the zealotry, um, that the, there are many commonalities. So, and, and obviously I'm biased. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that not all roads lead to Scotland, but the influences that came out of Scotland are profound. Yeah, okay. Stuart Cleland asks, Ian, is the SRIS an esoteric order or an order for esoteric masons? Oh, that's that's an interesting one. Um, I'd welcome your thoughts, Stuart. Stuart, are you going to uh, brave the mic again? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Ian. <laughs> Do, do, does SRIS teach esoteric things? Are the grades esoteric or is it just for people who have already looked into this type of thing to come together and meet and discuss the ideas? But would you say the grades themselves are esoteric? You know, it's, it, it's, it's that kind of thing, again, that um, probably like the craft. You know, what, what does the craft say? Well, what, what's your interpretation of what the craft says? And Grand Lodge is very, um, uh, you know, it's fundamental that, uh, Freemasonry is not dogmatic, nor is um, the SRIS. Um, we signpost within the actual grades. The, the, there's some interesting, yeah, there's some interesting pieces there, and that's that's probably a, a, another discussion for 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 another day. I, I, I like to think that it's a it's a it's a melting pot for people who are esoterically inclined, um, and I really think that true learning comes from um, experience and from the seed thoughts that come from others that we can um, expand upon and develop further. So, you know, going back to the 17th century, the seeds were maybe planted then, but where we're at now and what we're learning now and where we go next is, is so much more than we had back then. So I'm definitely not one for being stuck in the past. Um, you know, all things must change and, and so, so must me, uh, so, so must we. Um, for me, that spiritual element, which a lot of people poo-poo, or, or now we're, we're actually seeing more and more young people who have a passion for something more, but they're not looking for dogma. They're not looking to be told what to think and what to do. And I think that we arguably have more of a freedom within the SRIS than brethren do within the Grand Lodge, where um, you know some of what we need to visit are the constraints that are arguably in some cases too structured. Uh, arguably we're in the age of uh, Aquarius, which is all about flow and uh, not, not structures. And we're, we're seeing around the planet, um, anything that's too fixed is now beginning to break and crumble. So, so we need that fluidity, fluidity of thought and, and action, but with uh, um, absolutely with the correct intention for, for, for good. Thank you very, very much, Brother Ian 
Uh, Bern, we, we are coming to the time that we said we would take a break. I do appreciate there are a couple of questions that we've not got to, uh, but I'm sure Ian will be able to, to put uh, an answer to them in the chat room. Bren, I, I very much appreciate we've we've been sitting for just over two hours now. Uh, it's a long time for, for most of us, I would imagine. I, I'm, the meeting room will stay open. Uh, we will have a 10 minute formal break and when we come back at 20 past three, I'll be delighted to introduce to you brother Jamie Paul Lamb, who's going to give us an insight into astrological symbolisms in Freemasonry. Uh, Jamie is one of our other speakers from uh, the USA and we look forward to giving them a, a warm Scottish welcome at 20 past three. So Bren, uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves in chat just now. Uh, go and make a cup of tea, uh, have a wee dram, whatever takes your fancy at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon and we'll be back with you uh, in about 10 minutes time. Ian. I think he's gone for a pee break, Alan. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and having looked at most, and having looked at most of the gallery, I think it's a similar. <laughs> Me also. I'm also going. Cheers. <laughs> Yeah, empty chairs, empty tables. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a long sit for some. Uh, I just had a delivery. How do we delivery this afternoon, Gordon? What did you get? The man who would be king? Yeah. Well, I, I, I just received uh, Empires of the Dead, which is a story of the Commonwealth war graves. And that was the door with French Freemasonry, a French view. Brother Gordon and brethren, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for asking me. Jamie, thank you so much for coming along. We're very much looking forward to, to listening to you this afternoon. Uh, many of the brethren will, will be aware of you and your books, and uh, we certainly were uh, when we were pulling this together. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, early morning for you in Arizona, uh, I believe. Oh, yeah. Well, 8.13 right now so not so early but we have a new puppy that we've been tending to so that takes up that makes the mornings a little go a little longer yeah <laughs> yeah yeah brother robertson's uh presentation was fantastic i'm glad i got to tune in for most of it yeah. well the, the the previous two stuart and uh, i know you know joe uh, they, they were recorded so be on our youtube channel the, the whole session uh, so everybody will be able to catch up uh, later oh, on great. on parts of it. Perfect. Uh, and what I said to the, the other speakers, Jamie, because I know you've just come along uh, relatively recently onto the, the session, is that you've got your, your 40 minutes. Uh, make the best use of the time. Uh, if you can fit in a couple of questions uh, if the last five minutes for the brain, that's great. And if not, we'll put them onto our Facebook channel and we'll try and continue the conversation uh, there if anybody's got any questions. Uh, but thank you again for coming along. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, I think this is one of those presentations where it can expand or contract. So um, I think I can get it, you know, I think I can get it to 30 minutes and maybe leave 10 minutes um, if I go through the material relatively quickly. Yeah, that, yeah uh, it's, it's totally in your hands, so. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, I think it's Parkinson's law, the expansion and contraction of work that work will fit into the time the time allotted for it. So we'll, tr we'll try and invoke that law. 
And we, we've been pretty good so far following the agenda. I, I, I remember having an old boss who says, uh, your agenda is your agenda and that should be stuck to and there should be only good reasons for extending uh, or uh, running over or being short of or having less more time available. Uh, you should know what you're planning. So uh, hopefully they, they say, I know that the second half will go the same way. Yeah. Right. Just a brief note. I've put a note, message in that I have to leave. Thanks for the oh, afternoon Charles. so far, but it's been fantastic. So thanks, I'll Charles. Leave. Good to see you. That's good. And you. Thanks. Bye. And for those brethren who I have got nothing better to do at five o'clock, our Grandmaster Mason, Brother Ramsey McGee, is in conversation with the District Grand Lodge uh, of Lebanon of the Scottish Craft uh, on you will find the Zoom details on a, a variety of the Scottish Masonic Facebook pages. Uh, so that's, you can leave here at five o'clock, Bern, and uh, nip over to, to the Lebanon uh, if you so desire. Uh, one of the, the benefits of Zoom meetings, uh, it can give us a, an active mind all day and every day if you so choose. So, Susan, yeah. how's uh, Lucy's Al wound? Al Alan's wanting to tell us. Uh, Alan, you're, you're on. Put your mute on if you're shouting for your cup of tea, Oh, please. sorry. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I don't mind it as long as Susan delivers coffee everywhere. Yeah. All right. That's, that's a challenge of having old past masters, Brian. You have to keep them in check at times. All right. Uh, we'll have less of the old. Go on, very quiet, uh, Gordon. Have you got a minute? Yes, David. Good afternoon. Thanks for letting me in. No, uh, no, I was no, looking no. frantically for, uh, while the uh, previous speaker was speaking there, for some photographs that I took a number of years ago when uh, my wife and I went on holiday, Rosicrucian's um, castle. And I can't for the life of me remember whereabouts it was. He may well have had a lot of castles, of course, but uh, this one was dedicated as a museum to him. Uh, would anybody on the, uh, on the net today know where that might be? I can't find any photographs at the moment. Was it Strasbourg or, or Tübingen, maybe? I'm not entirely sure. David if, you put it in the David, if you can put it in the chat as a question, we'll put it up later on on the Facebook and we'll uh, maybe have a wider reach by doing that because I'll look at all the questions that are in the chat and put the questions and answers up later on. Okay, it's just a case of selecting chat and typing away then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, the, nat the National Grid will be wondering why there was a, a, a spike in el electricity use across Scotland at 10 past three this afternoon. The kettle went on. But this is much more interesting than Coronation Street when they have the normal <laughs> spikes of electricity <laughs> use. So the, uh... And for our Bern overseas who may not know what Coronation Street is, Bern, it's our longest running soap uh, that's been on. It's about a, a street in a, a fictional Manchester community. Uh, and I would recommend it to you uh, all. Uh, my granny used to watch it and I'm still a wee bit addicted to it every now and again and more so that we can't get out to our Masonic meetings. Uh, I, I went to visit friends in Canada. And the very first thing that they challenged us with when we got to meet uh, Alan Tibbetts and uh, all his friends and whatever was, what's happening on Coronation Street yet? And because we're on a farm, so we don't watch it because we have a soap running around us all our lives. <laughs> okay, Brian, that sauce. I back at 20 past three. I am going... Uh... 
mute you all again. And if I can ask Jamie uh, to uh, unmute himself when he comes back. Uh, Jamie, can you just say hello to me again, please? Sorry, I was just plugging in my headset. Uh, no. I missed I missed that last sentence. No, that's fine. It was just to make sure that you 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 can come off mute uh, before I introduce you. That's fine. Thank you. So, Brian, welcome back to the second half of the Lodge Hope of Karachi number three three seven uh, Masonic Esoterica Lockdown Symposium. I thank you to our three wonderful and fascinating speakers of the first half, Brother Stuart Cleland, Brother Joe Wages and Brother Ian Robertson. I'm sure, like me, every one of the brethren on here has certainly made their daily advancement in Masonic knowledge, which is one of our purposes here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi to help you do so. Brian, we have uh, two speakers for you in the second half of the symposium, and I'm delighted to welcome the first of those, Brother Jamie Paul Lamb, who is joining us from Arizona. Uh, Jamie is the author of two books on the subject of Western esotericism, Myth, Magic and Masonry. What a beautiful title. Uh, Occult Perspectives in Freemasonry, uh, and the other book, Approaching the Middle Chamber. Uh, Jamie is a, a current member of the Ascension Lodge number 89, uh, the Arizona College of the, I'm going to try this as well, the Societis Rosicruciana and Civitibus Federatis. Uh, maybe uh, I'm getting a thumbs up there, Ian, for my pronunciation. I'm definitely getting one from Jamie. So uh, there's all these big words burning in the esoteric Freemasonry that you have to get your tongue around. Uh, and he is a member of the Hermetic Society, uh, based in Arizona, where he lives with his wife, and there are many animals, and as some of you may have learned, they're new puppy. Uh, so good luck with that, Jamie. And it gives me the greatest of pleasure to, to hand over to you now, Jamie, uh, to talk to us about uh, astrological symbolism in Freemasonry. Thank you very much, Brother Mitchie, it's, uh, and brethren, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to present for uh, Lodge Hope of, well, now here's another word, Karachi. That's Karachi. perfect, Karachi, yeah. Karachi, um, pleasure to be here. I'm gonna jump right into it because I know time is tight. I'm gonna share screen and from beginning. So, as Brother Mitchie said, my presentation this morning is on astrological symbolism in Freemasonry. I did want to just um, sort of have a caveat up front here that I'm just applying a critical sort of interpretive perspective to our work and our symbolism and our ritualism uh, from the perspective of astrology. I'm not trying to imply that we actually do astrology in our Masonic work because astrology is a particular thing with particular operations and its own set of vernacular and rules and a, a grammar of astrology, if you will. So uh, obviously we don't do that conspicuously in Masonry, but um, there are I have found, and many as many of us have seen, I'm sure, um, some somewhat cryptic allusions to astrological s symbolism, and some that are a little more um, obvious or conspicuous. That being said, the sort of key points that I wanted to can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah, your sounds perfect, Jamie. Okay, great, and. My PowerPoint is taking up the entirety of your screen. It says yes. Great. Okay, so the key points that I sort of wanted to get across today were, were, were three. There are astrological illusions in Masonic ritual and symbolism. Some, like I said, some of which are pretty conspicuous, others not so much. Astrology is in many ways complementary to our work as Freemasons, which I hope to kind of elucidate that point as we go through this presentation. And that finally, the UGLE, the UGLE inception chart, which was the chart from, uh, what was it, uh, June 24th, 1717, is in fact, uh, well, 
there's good reason to suspect that that chart was elected. So in astrological vernacular, that means uh, chosen for a particular time, even for a particular hour, and sometimes even fractions of that arc segments of the ecliptic that happen to be um, culminating or on the eastern horizon or the ascendant at certain times. So there are reasons to be um, suspicious of an astrological election for the UGLE inception chart. So those are kind of the points that I want to elucidate through this presentation. Now, to talk about astrology, obviously we all know quite a bit about Freemasonry, but uh, astrology maybe not so much because in the modern era we tend to think of pop astrology and sun sign astrology and all this sort of hippified um, new agey uh, iterations of the art. So I think it's important to sort of set up uh, a serious perspective to look at astrology and, and to know that astrology up until uh, so at some point in the enlightenment uh, was considered a science pretty much indistinguishable from astronomy and certainly carrying a lot of the hermetic current with it. And when I say hermetic, I mean essentially the sympathetic or resonant relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. So astrology, it's, it's predicated on the idea that these celestial events and phenomena indicate terrestrial events, not that they cause them. So we're not trying to imply causality, although Ptolemy and Aristotle would. They would say that these the celestial, the etheric celestial spheres um, had a certain relationship with the sublunary sphere, which then uh, had a causal effect elementally in the, uh, well, the elemental sphere, the sublunary sphere of Earth. And so that was that was pretty much science at that time. They would, uh, Galen, certainly Aristotle, Vettius Valens, um, many astrologers and philosophers uh, held to that view, uh, Paracelsus, et cetera, held to this view that there were, uh, that there was a causal sort of effect from the etheric spheres on the sublunary sphere. Um, but I'm not arguing that point. Uh, I prefer to think of it that the planets don't cause celestial or terrestrial events any more than the hands on a clock cause cause it to be you know three o'clock or whatever. Uh, they're indicative, just as the hands of a clock are indicative of what time it is. It sort of symbolizes that or or uh, implies that. So. Astrology as we know it begins in the Hellenistic period, so in Alexandria primarily. That's when these pieces start to come together from uh, Egyptian decans, the 10 degree arc segments of the ecliptic, which were primarily temporal in their use. They had an hour watcher who saw the ascension of certain asterisms or small sort of small constellations on the eastern horizon and these marked temporal periods. Um, there's also the, as we said, this sort of hermetic idea. Uh, in the Alexandrian milieu, of course, we had Neoplatonic currents, Gnostic, early Christian, hermetic, uh, sort of uh, a, a melting pot of these philosophies, these ideas. And it was within that enterprise in Alexandria that we sort of see the, uh, the codification of what we think of as astrology, which is a very particular thing. Um, and uh, so thinking about that, you know, from our perspective, as I said, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, pop astrology with your sun sign, you know, what sign are you? I'm a Capricorn, etc. And that's uh, extremely sort of myopic within the greater scope of astrological theory. It's, it, it doesn't tell you much. That's not um, representative of a serious look at astrology. So 
what we're trying, it's sort of a gross oversimplification of something that's a pretty complex subject. As I said, it was, uh, it encompassed astronomy. Astronomy was merely the sort of quantitative um, element of astrology. So we, we needed to know these cycles, these epicycles, these deference, we, in order to calculate a chart and the movements of the celestial bodies in this sort of maybe a uh, post animistic uh, view of the cosmos that the microcosm is, is in a relationship with the macrocosm that there is a resonant relationship here. If you could see, let me turn this into a pointer, laser pointer, there we go. So here, as we see is this sort of Ptolemaic Aristotelian model of the cosmos where you have the sublunary sphere, which contains earth and the elements. So they're in what Aristotle would call their natural place. Natural places are earth in the center, water on top of that, air on top of that, and, and fire being the, the final sort of most rarefied of the Empedoclean elements within that sublunary sphere. And you see that here. And then we have the seven classical planets visible to the ancients. And these were uh, in order sort of uh, concentrically encapsulating this uh, central sphere of the earth. So that's the kind of model we want to familiar familiarize ourselves with if we want to understand the theory of astrology outside of these planetary spheres was the sphere of the fixed stars which included the zodiac uh these the zodiac being uh sort of an import from mesopotamian cultures into that again alexandrian milieu where astrology was first codified so the major components, <clears throat> excuse me, of an astrological chart are four. So we think of planets, signs, houses, and aspects. So the planets are these planetary glyphs you see here, Saturn, the moon, uh, Pluto. Well, they wouldn't have known Pluto at that time, but uh, the, the seven classical planets and the, and the three, what we call transpersonal planets or modern planets. And so you have the planets, which are at any given time distributed in the signs. They're arrayed in these signs. So think of a astrological chart as being a snapshot of the cosmos where we see these planets uh, arrayed among the 360 degree ecliptic. So this would be the east the ascendant, the sun rises in the east. This is the midheaven or the uh, medium coeli. This is the descendant where the sun sets. So, and then the imum coeli or the IC is the nadir. So these mark the four sort of quarters of the ecliptic. And you can think of them as being east, south, west, and north for the IC. <clears throat> so one other, the third component would be the houses. You see one, two, three, four. And these houses you can think of as domains of experience or arenas of action maybe might be a better way to put it, where, where these um, zodiacally conditioned planetary energies play out in this house, this domain of action. So the 11th house would be, maybe friends and society. Uh, the second house would be property, money, finance, and things like that. And, and the last component, the fourth component would be the aspects, which are these geometrical relationships that happen between planets as they are distributed on this 360 degree circle. So there's where the sort of geometry comes into it in that we have aspects which can be inscribed within this circle. And these aspects denote certain relationships. Here's, here's a way to drive it home. This is a popular analogy that you hear uh, when you're thinking about the elements of astrology and that is the, the theater analogy. So uh, just as you have actors who are in wardrobe in certain 
pieces of the set, maybe at this writing table or on this sofa, in this chair or back here by the table, these, these would be those domains of activity. And then the dialogue as they speak to each other could be looked at as the aspects. So think of, think of the planets as the actors, the zodiacal signs, which condition planetary energies as the wardrobe. Think of the various places where activity can be performed as the houses. And then think of the dialogue between the actors as the aspects. So that's kind of the simplest way to think about it, but it's still much more complex than modern pop astrology with its sun signs and oversimplification. So again, I'm not trying to say that we practice astrology and Freemasonry, obviously we don't. Um, I'm not even arguing for the efficacy of astrology. Uh, that's on you to examine. And I hope, uh, you know, many people examine astrology and they already have the idea that it's the pseudoscience and that it's not based on any sort of empirical um, observation or there's no causality to it. It's not, it doesn't fit with this mechanistic sort of Newtonian or Cartesian paradigm that we all still seem to entertain even after such uh, uh, discoveries and innovations over the last century regarding quantum and, and Jung's observations about synchronicity. Uh, these are things that we have to, we have to revise our opinion of astrology if we're, if we're going up to approach it with any seriousness. Uh, otherwise, you know, if we're just uh, going into the endeavor thinking this is pseudoscience, that's sort of, you could think of that as an disingenuous kind of approach to the subject and not taking it very seriously. Uh, Albert Mackey in his encyclopedia says astrology, a science demanding the respect of the scholar, let me move this window, notwithstanding its designation as a black art and in a reflective sense an occult science, a system of divination foretelling results by the relative positions of the planets and other heavenly bodies toward the earth. Men of eminence have adhered to the doctrines of astrology as a science. It is a study well considered in and forming an important part of the ceremonies of the philosophers of the fourth grade of the first order of the Society of Rosicrucians. Astrology has been deemed the twin science of astronomy, grasping knowledge from the heavenly bodies and granting a proper understanding of many of the startling forces in nature. It is claimed that the constellations of the zodiac govern the earthly animals and that every star has its particular nature, property, and function, the seal and character of which it impresses through its rays upon plants, minerals, and animal life. This science was known to the ancients as the divine art. So that's from his encyclopedia. Now, Freemason, Freemasons have long been associated and interested in um, astrology. It, as astrology is um, central to uh, esoterica in general, central to the Western esoteric tradition. If you were to create a Venn diagram of, of Kabbalah and ceremonial magic and, and tarot and theurgy and hermeticism, et cetera, et cetera, if you were to create each of those, a Venn diagram of this, which each of those subjects being a sphere, then where they overlap would would almost certainly be astrology, because astrology and the astrological perspective in general sort of permeates all of these uh, various arts. And, and I hope to show that uh, Freemasonry can be included in this Venn diagram with an overlap of astrological symbolism. Uh, I just showed some works here from the likes of uh, Robert Hewitt Brown, uh, Manley P. Hall, uh, Frank C. Higgins, Pike, and I had to put my own book from 2018 in there where I deal pretty heavily with uh, this astrological perspective. So jumping right into it, let me look at the time. Jumping right into it, um, we find the, the Anna Lucas is a good place to start. When we think of um, 4000 BCE, 
we're talking about approximately the commencement of the Torian age. Now the Torian age was the, due to axial precession, this was a 2,160 year plus or minus uh, period during which the sun rose during the vernal equinox in the sign of Taurus. So that's, that's what that means. So there's, uh, hence, if you look at the cover of my book, I show a zodiacal wheel here with uh, actually a minotaur, but um, sort of indicating that Lucas, which is a recurring theme throughout this particular book as I examine those subjects. Um, again, we talked about the form of a lodge and um, we talked about how this is a Renaissance era zodiacal chart or astrological chart wherein you would find the east the south the west and the north and laying something from uh, you know the masonic lodge room on its side you see that the the worshipful master is in the east uh, junior warden in the south uh, the senior warden in the west and then the north would be corresponding to the imam koeli, the nadir, the place of darkness. So there is a certain directionality or a certain orientation and certain circumambulations and epicycles, et cetera, that sort of uh, correlate to our movements or what we might colloquially call the, our floor work in Masonic ritual. The terrestrial globes are perhaps the most conspicuous um, the terrestrial and celestial globes atop the pillars are perhaps the most conspicuous uh, nod to this hermetic idea, the hermetic dynamic between the microcosm and the macrocosm, where we find the terrestrial sphere, of course, resent, uh, representing the microcosm, the celestial sphere, the macrocosm, and that they have this resonant <clears throat> complementary relationship. And that complementarity, if I can create a word I'm not sure that that complementarity sort of um, informs our work in in a sense as well as astrology so this is certainly a shared element and uh, the the officers is another thing to think about if you if you look at the floor work obviously we talk about the sun rising in the east culminating at high 12 the glory and beauty of the day um, setting in the west etc there are certain uh, archetypal kind of uh, significations that are taken on by the officers of a lodge uh, I don't know Scottish ritual, how much it, it differs from American ritual, but I know, for example, you could say the senior deacon in American ritual is very hermetic in that he guides the candidate. He sometimes even guides him through what you might consider the underworld or low 12 and uh, in this analogy. So there are, there are certain archetypal roles that are taken up by the officers of a Masonic lodge that could be easily construed as being planetary in nature, thus making them sort of astrological. And again, you know, we have, we've already covered sort of the elements in the sublunary sphere and how this works out. Um, I know many of you are probably Rosicrucians. I saw that the program today included a lot of Rosicrucianism and in Rosicrucianism, uh, we deal with Hermeticism and Kabbalah. So thereby astrology is uh, squarely within the purview of our work as Rosicrucians, as Masonic Rosicrucians. And if you look at the, uh, I just found one that happened to have all the planetary glyphs on them, but uh, you can see that it is a, maybe a concatenation of this same model where you find the earth, the moon, like Luna here, that first celestial sphere, then going up to Mercury, Venus, the sun, Gabora or Mars, Chesed or or Jupiter, so on. Next would be, this is kind of an odd distribution up here once we get into the supernals, but we won't get into this uh, slightly less than perfect representation of that. But we do find that in the Kircher tree, which is widely used in modern Western esoterica, uh, we find that this model certainly displays um, the geocentric model. 
I'm not going to get too much into this segment only because I'm not sure if everyone here is a master mason. Um, so I, I will just sort of allude to what's going on here. I talk about it in depth in the book. So if you're an entered apprentice or a fellow craft, you might not want to read the section on astrology uh, until you have taken your master mason degree because I, I essentially take a certain legend that master masons are familiar with and apply it to certain um, operations in the mist and initiatory rites in the mystery traditions as well as other mythological motifs that have to do with the sun's the sun's annual circuit through the signs so it's it's death it's rebirth etc i'm sure you're aware of this uh, astrological sort of interpretation being applied to christian symbolism and uh, i will argue I argue in my book that it's equally applicable to um, a certain tragedy that that master masons are aware of. Now, quickly getting into, uh, let's do the point point within a circle. Obviously, a solar, you know, this is gold or the sun. It is the astrological glyph. This circumpunct is the astrological glyph for uh, the sun. It is also gold. It is embordered by two parallel perpendicular lines representing the St. John, who we know are the, the tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, and that they represent these solstitial kind of markers, the volume of sacred law being on the ascendant in the east. So this is sort of turned up with the east being here, maybe the, uh, the, the south being here, the west, and the north where we find um, uh, the summer solstice. Our working tools, as we're aware, they're 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 uh, designed for geometry: the square, the compasses, etc. And uh, these working tools were equally important to astrologers as they were to architects and builders, as they were to um, navigation and astronomy etc so these in that we we can locate the position of celestial bodies using things like the pythagorean theorem and using things like uh we uh the 360 degree circle or the sexagesimal system which really an ancient babylonian sort of innovation this 360 degree circle defines every single way that we communicate about space and time. So when we're dividing uh, the 360 degree circle into 90 degrees or uh, 60 degrees for a sextile, 120 degrees for a uh, trine aspect, these are used in astrology as well as building, as well as uh, just abstract geometrical constructions with uh, a straight edge and compass, and um, as well as navigation, etc. And all it, by geometry, it says we are enabled to make our observations and fix the duration of time and seasons, years and cycles. We discover how the planets move in their orbits and demonstrate their various revolutions. Moving on to the Royal Arch. I've got 12 minutes. Moving on to the Royal Arch, we find that uh, that here on an old tracing board, they make no bones about Cancer being the um, the keystone in the keystone position, the 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 Royal Arch of the heavens, where the sun is at its greatest, um, its highest declination. So you could also look at this as the what we talked about, the medium coeli or the local meridian. The summer solstice occurs in Cancer. So we find on either side here with Aries and Libra being these equinoctial periods on the pillars. Um, we also find the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man from Ezekiel's vision, also from Revelation. Uh, and the the a representation of this tetramorph, you would call it, in uh, scriptural vernacular, this 
this tetramorph is the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. They are also on the veils of the tabernacle as well as in the royal arch banner. And these represent um, by many accounts the, the zodiacal signs of Leo, Taurus, Aquarius, and Scorpio with Scorpio being uh, e equally represented by the eagle due to Aquila the constellation Aquila, which is in proximity. So we find these are uh, represented very plainly actually in the Royal Arch. And, and another component of Royal Arch Masonry, I'm just gonna read this from Josephus. The vestments of the high priest being made of linen signifies the earth. The blue denotes the sky, the ephod, the universe of four elements, the breastplate to be placed in the middle of the ephod to represent the earth. For that occupies the middle place in the world. Remember that Aristotelian Ptolemaic system with the sublunary sphere. And the girdle signifies the ocean, for that goes about everything. And the two sardonoxes uh, that were in the clasps on the high priest's shoulder, aka the Urim and Thummim, indicate to us the sun and the moon. And for the 12 stones, whether we understand them by the months or the 12 signs of what the Greeks call the zodiac, we shall not be mistaken in their meaning. So we find this Choshen Mispet uh, or the, the, um, the breastplate of the high priest having these 12 gemstones. And in fact, it is said that this is from whence we get the very gemstone doctrine in terms of correspondences uh, to various precious stones and their zodiacal counterparts. Speaking of Societas Rosicruciana in Civitatibus Federatus, uh, we find here, if you see these stoles, this is from my college here in Arizona, uh, Taurus, Aquarius, Scorpio, and Leo. Can't see those too well, but that's they actually have the elemental and zodiacal glyphs corresponding to the the four ancients who are the tetramorph. They're the very same four zodiacal signs, the fixed signs of the zodiac, creating a cross uh, on the ecliptic, and and each with an elemental uh, correspondence. So very much a. Uh, uh, conspicuous zodiacal illusion there. Not even alluded, I mean, it's patently obvious that, that, that this is what these are supposed to represent. Okay, now um, we'll quickly go through just some early, a couple of early speculative Freemasons, not as early as those in Scotland granted, but we do have Elias Ashmole, um, 1846, as Brother Robinson said, he was raised at, I believe, Warrington, but um, he was a, a speculative Freemason, an early speculative Freemason, an ardent astrologer, and what Thomas de Quincey called a zealous Rosicrucian. I could get more into Rosicrucianism's connection with astrology, but that would be another deal, uh, another presentation, as that has to do with millenarianism, Joachim millenarianism, and certain conjunctions that have taken place, one of which we've recently uh, experienced, the Jupiter and Saturn conjunction on the first degree of Aquarius, which is uh, momentous. Uh, this is Sibley, who erected a, a, a very popular chart for the uh, Declaration of Independence of the United States. And this is William Lilly, whose patron was Elias Ashmole. Uh, though Lilly was, to my knowledge, not a Freemason, he was a very um, notable astrologer. Uh, Christian astrology was the name of his main work, and he, a lot of his work um, carries forward to today, a lot of his uh, sort of resurrection of ancient astrological ideas that were lost um, come to us through Lily. Now, here's the fun part. This is the sort of last segment of my uh, presentation where I try to convince you that the the 
the inception chart of the foundation of the UGLE was um, likely an astrological election. And what we mean by election, when you elect a time astrologically to do something, you are putting the momentum of the cosmos behind your endeavor. So that is to say, you could start at some random time, you can start some important endeavor at some random time and theoretically be sort of cosmically doomed. You know, if you do this at an inauspicious moment, whatever the important undertaking is, without invoking the blessings of this particular um, segment of deity, let's say, um, the cosmos itself in an imminent model, then you could perhaps get off on the wrong foot. However, if you elect a certain time to set a, a causal cycle in motion, um, to begin a, to initiate an activity, then it is said in astrological, according to astrological theory, that you would have the momentum of the cosmos behind your endeavor. So some of the things that are going on here, the first being the most obvious is that they chose to um, uh, form the UGLE on June 24th, which is the feast day of St. John the Baptist. It is in the proximity of the summer solstice. So thereby, I could stop right there and say that this was astrological just due to that, because they're in proximity of the summer solstice and um, thereby sort of aligning themselves to this, the sun at its greatest height, the sun at its, at its most powerful uh, point of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but there is more. Uh, the day of the week was Thursday, which is ruled by Jupiter, uh, Jupiter, the king of the gods. And in his expansiveness and beneficence sort of um, provided some buoyancy for this event. You see that the sun was conjunct Jupiter at the midheaven, not only conjunct, but what in what we call an astrological uh, vernacular, it was Kazimi. That is to say, in the heart of the sun, Jupiter was in the heart of the sun on the very degree within four minutes. Um, so 13 degrees um, cancer at the summer solstice. So very much tapping into that sort of Jupiterian astrological current, very auspicious because Jupiter is, is exalted in cancer and because uh, Jupiter in its beneficence sort of, um, again, provided buoyancy. You find here also that Hermes and Aphrodite, that is to say Mercury and Venus, were also on the very same degree, 17 degrees, thereby speaking to the sort of um, hermetic leanings of the craft, that they chose a time when they could create this astrological rebus, sort of this divine androgyne. And I say androgyne because it is Hermes and Aphrodite, the hermaphrodite, the androgyne, the rebus, the union of opposites and the sort of, in some respects, the summum bonum. And that this is also within proximity of the midheaven, which is 13 degrees at this hour. Um, that we find the elevation of this sort of great work, which is, uh, you don't just, uh, I'm arguing that you don't just run into these things sort of by accident, you know, and notice that um, the ascendant, so where the, where the sun rose, the eastern horizon was at 10 degrees Libra. So that is, you could construe that as being on the level, you know, the ascendant is uh, Libra, from the Latin meaning scales or balance level. Uh, so the ascendant was on the level. The part of fortune or the body or the community um, was in the 11th house. The 11th house is uh, auspicious for societies, for um, groups, of, for collectives and groups of people, affinity groups, etc. These are all sort of significations allotted to the 11th house and to have the part of fortune there in Leo, Leo being itself a very important um, Masonic sign due to a certain component of our third degree ritual, Leo. And, um, and 
I'm not going to get too far. I could get further into this if I knew we were all master masons, but there's not enough time anyway. So um, the part of fortune being there sort of squarely puts the fraternity in this Leonine 11th house, also very auspicious for the formation of societies and, uh, and humanitarian humanitarianism to some extent and the free thinking expression of the, the craft. So what I'm saying, because of just these few things that I've pointed out, I would argue that um, this was almost certainly an astrological election. It would be um, due to it being in the summer in the proximity of the summer solstice due to this conjunction, this conjunction, um, the ascendant on the level, the situation of the part of fortune in Leo in the 11th house. It's just very, uh, very suspicious for, uh, for this being an election. And knowing that there were some astrologers taken as accepted Masons um, with, let's say, Elias Ashmole being our exemplar to that point, um, it is not inconceivable to say that uh, that astrologers were involved in this process. So the key takeaways, uh, basically reiterating what I wanted to cover in this, and, and those takeaways are, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, because I know the, the vernacular is sort of abstruse and there's a learning curve in astro learning astrological theory, et cetera, we will say that there are astrological illusions in Masonic ritual. Okay, that's clear, and symbolism. Um, astrology is in many ways complementary to our work as Freemasons. I could go into this further, um, but if you if if you choose to, um, maybe learn a little bit about astrology, which I which I said is uh, central to Western esotericism. Central, as in definitely in the middle of the mix of all Western esotericism. Astrology is, is a key component, the key component. And um, our work as Freemasons um, is complemented by this astrological uh, perspective. And lastly, that the UGLE inception chart was likely an astrological election, which I hope to have at least um, caused you to... Uh, at least question that. And that is all that I have. I'm going to escape out of here. And I really, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, brethren. It's a pleasure and an honor. I'll lastly say that uh, in the United States, I think we all recognize the primacy of Scottish uh, masonry. And certainly in the SRICF, uh, we're all aware of Robert Wentworth Little and the, again, the primacy of, of Scottish Rosicrucianism, at least in the Masonic domain. Uh, thanks so much. Brother Jamie, Paul Lamb, thank you so much for coming along this afternoon or this morning uh, in Arizona to speak to us on such an interesting subject. I, I think myself, like possibly many on here were hello astronomers or hello magazine astronomers or the local paper astronomers and we, we woke up in the morning to see what uh, the star sign was going to say. Uh, many people tell me that I am a true Gemini uh, and I'll just leave that at that uh, before anybody is a uh, cheeky to me because they've got a, a a habit of being that as well, Jamie. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, there's more than a couple of questions, but for time, I'm going to only ask one. And Jamie, I would ask if you can have a look in the chat box and maybe put an answer to the other ones. That would be very much appreciated. Uh, the, the first question, and we're, we're taking on your uh, Masonic principles, Ben, that we're all Master Masons here. Uh, we have a, a question from Brother Matthew, Quesh, uh, Matthew Christmas. Based on the, the Graham manuscript and other references amongst the old charges and in Anderson's second set of constitutions in 1734, there's a clear steer that Noah may have been the precursor of the Holy Arch uh, in the early third degree rituals. Uh, I was there. 
hiatus yet. I wasn't want to say it out. <laughs> uh, interestingly, the, the heavens are key to that. It's generally over the flood in reference to sun, moon, and stars. It appears important in English REM ritual with reference to the roles of that mariners should play. Uh, Jamie says we're all master masons. So, um, well, I say I think we are. Have you looked at this at all, Jamie? Or do you have a comment on that? Uh, regarding the second set of the old charges and the Graham manuscript, etc. Yeah, and whether Noah was a precursor to uh, the lead character in the, what we now know as the third degree. Um, not my area of expertise in terms of the lineage of our ritual and things, but I do, I am aware of Noachide masonry. I haven't done the, I think it's the Grand Mariner uh, degree, which is part in America, that's part of our allied Masonic degrees, uh, sort of a collection of extant <coughs> degrees that are not currently practiced. Um, I have not done that degree, so I can't speak uh, with any authority on that in particular. I'm aware of Noachide masonry and that it was a, a predecessor to um, our hieramic work. Okay, but uh, but that, that no, be no worries. We, we'll put that one back to the, the wider chat than Matthew, I think. I, a couple that are astro astronomically related before we move on and say thank you to you. Uh, Stuart Cleland, am I right in saying then that Leo is in the northeast corner? It, now that depends on axial precession because it has moved. Um, so if we if we dial the clock back, and this is what I do in myth, magic, and masonry, uh, in order to approach Masonic symbolism, I sort of dial the precessional clock back to 4000 BCE. And if you do that, then you find that the situations of the equinoxes and solstices fall in those fixed signs of the zodiac. That is to say, Leo, Taurus, Scorpio, and Aquarius. And when you do that, you find Leo at the summer solstice, the beauty and glory of the day, the royal arch of the heavens. Um, and finding that there, there are there are some compelling sort of observations you can make from that, from the perspective of the Anna Lucas, and only from that perspective, because that is the, um, that is our symbolic, um, time of creation, et cetera. So, and we use that Masonically for dating. I would say, go back to the Anno Lucas, look at the situation of the Zodiac, and that will unlock much more of the astrological symbolism of our work. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. There's, there's a huge amount of questions coming in for you, but for time's sake, Brian, I, I'm just going to ask Jamie to have a look at them. I think one of the, the recurring themes, Jamie, is are there any books that you can recommend for the beginner into this part of their Masonic journey out with your own? And I will put the link up to your own as well. So, Jamie, at this time, on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of Karachi and all our guests here this afternoon at our Masonic Esoteric uh, Lockdown Symposium, can I thank you, sir, for your work and your very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. And please do stay with us for our final presentation of the afternoon, if at all you have the time to spare. Thank you, sir. Certainly, it was an honor and a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And this has been a, a tremendous event and I'll be sticking around and answering some questions in the chat. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. So, Brian, we, we come to the, the final, uh, and I would say last but not least presentation of our Masonic Esoteric Lockdown Symposium. Uh, again, this brother has been part of our lockdown lecture series over the lockdown pandemic. Uh, he's very well known to us all here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi. Uh, but the company he works for is probably world renowned uh, as the leading uh, publisher of Masonic books. Uh, Martin, as, as we know, the general manager of Lewis Masonic. Uh, just a little bit about Martin uh, before he comes on. Uh, Martin Fox, uh, his interest in history and philosophy led him into Freemasonry and he was initiated into the Burlington Lodge in December 2001 and he took the chair in 2009. He's an active member of Burlington, having been assistant director of ceremonies for a few years. Uh, Burlington Lodge is one of the earliest founded lodges in England, and it was the first ever to have an inner guard. Uh, it was also one of the two founding lodges of the Emulation Lodge of Improvement, which went on to found Emulation Ritual. 
Uh, the last few years have been very exciting for Martin. He first published A Mosaic Palace, Freemasonry and the Art of Memory. And that was a culmination of several years of research into the underlying structure of masonry. And his first his bindings were first presented to Quarter Coronati Atelier in Rome. And over the years, he's given very many presentations. This afternoon, I to round off our first online Masonic Esoteric Symposium, I, Martin's going to talk to us about the Tomb of Christian Rosenkrauts and the Memory Palace. Martin, welcome back to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, sir, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honour to be back here, and may I start off by saying what wonderful presentations have preceded me. It's uh, been really enjoyable and informative. So, brethren, you heard uh, that I am a memory practitioner and enthusiast, and that's very important uh, for the, the talk I'm going to give you today. In my spare time, when other people watch television or socialize or other things like that, I spend my time practicing memory techniques. Memory techniques, both ancient and modern. So you can be reassured that as we go through this journey, there's nothing I'm describing that I haven't explored in depth. Now to, to take this journey, I need you to do something for me now. I need you to leave your present surroundings and to go to somewhere else. Because we're all Freemasons, this should be a, an easy thing to do. I'd like you to imagine the place that you would associate with being uh, the most sacred and special in terms of your uh, self-development. Uh, perhaps it was the lodge room that you initiated in. Uh, maybe you can visualize a place where uh, you have most felt that kind of connection. Now really take that feeling and amplify that. Imagine that you just know this is a place where the teachings you need to learn are held. Now, everyone could be in a different place here. Some people be in a lodge room. Some people, if they're in SIA they'd, they're, or a Rosicrucian organization, they might be in a, where their college meets. For me, I'm, I'm actually in the House of the Temple in, uh, in America. You know, if you've visited that in Washington, this is a really uh, amazing place. This is where I kind of feel that kind of sense. That sense of feeling with some of this is to allow you to connect with how Brother N.N. must have felt in the story that I'm about to tell you. Brother N.N. was a member of a sacred group, the Brothers of the Rose Cross. He and his other brothers had decided that it was time for their fraternity to open up. And he'd been given a, a role to help this happen. His society had many great secret teachings. But even within the documents that they published themselves, there was more mentioned than his current brethren could do. Yes, they could heal the sick, keep themselves healthy, and their learning was supreme. They would all share amongst each other and they were excited about the discoveries and the insights of uh, their friends and brothers as they were their own. But legend said that the, the Rosicrucians had special techniques. They could read one book and it was as if they were reading them all. They knew ways to speak so that the angels could hear them and even so that the uh, natural forces would obey them. It was said they could live their life as if they'd lived from the beginning of time and would continue till the end. Their methods of regeneration were legendary. It was 
known that a Rosicrucian could be reborn back to youth uh, just by simply going through some form of process or incubation. Now, Brother N.N. could kind of see these as being symbolic. Uh, outside, they said that Rosicrucians could bring people back to life. Their rituals were very inspiring. But little did he know that his good intentions and hard work were about to restore these sacred teachings. You see, like everyone in this meeting, the brother N.N., was a builder, but in this case, an operative builder. So what would you do if you were an operative builder and you loved this organization and were put in charge of improving it? You start to make some improvements to the building. He noticed that the, the membership plaque, as it were, the large brass plate that had all the lists of the previous members there had a, a really ugly sort of sticking out uh, nail. So he thought, well, I'll start with that. And when he removed the nail, something amazing happened. There was a crumbling of the wall and he could feel a slight breeze. He'd opened some form of secret passage. As he crawled through the darkness and called for the aid of his brethren, he could see uh, that there was just a, a small plaster wall between him and what sounded like a hollow space. He took a, a crowbar and knocked at the, the plaster and it fell apart. But instead of darkness, light blinded him. It was so bright, it was like staring at the sun. And it took a while for his eyes uh, to uh, get used to it so he could even make anything out. Within the center of this room, this, this room that had seven walls uh, to it, he could see on the roof there was some form of miniature sun shining out beautifully. Upon the ceiling, which was divided into uh, seven triangles, there were holy symbols and images so uh, great that it, it felt as if he was being lifted up by them. And on the walls everywhere were sacred uh, carvings, uh, secret symbols and uh, drawers and cupboards that contained um, amazing items. Upon the floor were written and depicted the forces that a man of calling should learn to dominate and walk trampling as he lives his life. In the center of this, this vault, there was a grave, but instead of a gravestone, there's actually an altar. The brethren explored and they discovered that this tomb was that of their founder, Christian Rosencross, and that this had been deliberately set up to store all the sacred teachings, if ever they lost their way. Within the cupboards, there were devices and scientific instruments, uh, bells, uh, devices that played music, uh, lamps, and uh, various uh, beautiful trinkets that all had a lesson to them. Uh, below the altar, they found a special object, a miniature version of the whole of the universe that they could, they could look at, a miniature world, so they could understand uh, things from examination. Upon the, uh, the body of their founder, which was as perfect as in life and had not rotten in any way, there was a book, a book which contained the inner secrets of their order. Uh, but about the room, there were also other books, the works of Paracelsus and his students, of Hermes Trillis Majestus. This sacred tomb had been set up in every way as a form of vault to regenerate and preserve their order's teachings. Perhaps in this moment, Brother N. N. realized why the sacred house always felt so special. 
And now, brethren, this is the story in the, the first uh, Rosicrucian manifesto, the uh, Fama Fraternitatis. Uh, this is published in 1614. And it's a very important story. It's really, it's really put there for a purpose. Today, I would like to explore the interpretation of this as a memory palace. Uh, it's obviously very important to the Rosicrucian um, tradition. And I think I can offer some hints that could show that it was seen as uh, a memory practice or a description for memory practice. Now, there's lots of circumstantial and historical evidence that has been gone over in detail over this, uh, which shows you that the, the original uh, manifesto was published with another work that had references to memory, that shows you the kind of things that Rosicrucians were doing. I'm not covering all that. Uh, you can get that from people far better educated in historical matters than me. This is a memory practitioner telling you what a memory practitioner sees. So let's start off just with the art of memory. You've already heard about it briefly, so I'm just going to give you a refresher here. The art of memory uh, was a practice whereby you would use a, a building which you imagined in detail as a filing system for your recollection and recall. You would do this by imagining using all your senses, the walking route around that, like a pilgrimage, whereby you'd stop at different places in the building. If you were doing this uh, with your house, you would probably stop at the front door as location one, stop at uh, your um, the coat hangers in your porch as location two, uh, location three might be in your living room, your couch, uh, that maybe location four, your television. You need about 30 to 60 places in, in your memory palace, as this would be called. These then make your filing system. So if you want to remember something, you would put it in the location. So next time there's a shopping list, uh, someone says to you, you want to buy a certain number of items, you would put those uh, items in the locations in a emotionally stimulating an exciting way. It should be shocking, rude, silly, horrific, that kind of thing. So you don't imagine milk if you're going to buy it, uh, uh, sort of you would imagine the cow sitting on your, uh, your couch in that location. This was originally used very much for speech making. In fact, the Greek word uh, for uh, um, location is topic, and that's kind of come into our, our vernacular now. Now, it wasn't always a building. You could also do this with images. You could do this on your own body. You could do this with a painting, which is quite complicated. You could do this uh, kind of memory work with anything you can kind of walk around in your mind. To understand how the Rosicrucian practitioners would see this, you need to understand the Christian art of memory. It's, it was an art of transformation and improvement of the self, an art of virtue. So the idea is whatever you put into your mind becomes you. So if you were to form a, a building from the Bible, you would put figures, normally statues or symbols, which have a lesson to them into that building as you go uh, around. You'd probably memorize some poems and things connected to them. If you want to see some great examples of this, Hugh of St. Victor writes a wonderful text on how to do this with Noah's Ark. Um, Hugh of um, Richard of St. Victor, who's of course in Scotland and Driver Abbey, he um, writes about how to do this with the tabernacle. King Solomon's temple uh, was a very common uh, uh, memory palace. So what you put into your mind becomes you. And there's some very overt explanations of how this works. St. Thomas Aquinas and his teacher, Albert the Great, they had they'd sussed this out. Uh, if you read uh, the uh, commentary on the anima um, by, or by Aristotle, you will see Albert the Great clearly states how he feels this works. 
a image which put into the mind strongly has the same effect as a dramatic event in your life. Um, it goes into your estimative ability, into your subconscious or animal mind. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, he, he makes clear that uh, if you have a vow or an intention, if it's not associated by a corporeal similitude, a, a symbol, it slips away. So you need some an image to do this. Now, it wasn't just buildings that were used for Christianity, uh, Christian art and memory. There were other beautiful memory palaces. Uh, there's a book of the seraphim where he used the feathers of an angel and each feather has a, a, a principle or poem associated with it. Uh, the levels of, her, of hell, purgatory and heaven. That was a really popular uh, mystical uh, meditation. You'd go up through the levels of hell meeting the devils, seeing the punishments, and then you'd get to purgatory, having remembered all the things you shouldn't do, and you'd meet the demons and learn the things you had to do to make up for stuff. It's still not fun there. Purgatory's not as horrible as hell, but it's on the same heating system, kind of. It's really, it's not a good place. And eventually you end up in heaven. You get to meet the angels, receive blessings, and learn what you're do. This and other techniques, meditate and memory on the, uh, the wounds of Christ or the stations of the cross, these were seen as very deep meditative processes. And they even used the term meditatio. I, I've seen um, uh, Christian um, memory emblem books. They're, they're emblem books where you're, you're going to meditate through different uh, uh, stories and symbols. They look just like our tracing boards, actually. Um, and they could be used in many different ways uh, as, a, as a form of transformation and improvement of the character leading to your salvation. But some people even believe that through these, these contemplations, you could, you could actually visit the place. There were some, some recorded experiences where during their, their time in the higher levels uh, sort of here, when they're in the, in the, going into heaven, people felt that they had actually gone through, they'd blipped through into heaven for a few moments. And this, of course, is biblically justifiable, both in the Old and New Testament. There are accounts of people who visit heaven. Enoch's a very good example, but we do see in Corinthians a hint that some, um, someone's gone to the third level of heaven. So this is a, a, a positive practice from the Christian point of view. If this sounds familiar, it might be because you've read Dante, and uh, Dante, of course, wrote his the Divine Comedy, and this, this is a, a wonderful account. He'd been trained by the Dominicans of that actual practice. Um, so, yes, uh, this is the kind of level of visualisation that they would be taking part in. Observant uh, readers may have also noted that the highest level of Dante um, is in the shape of a rose. And this rose is formed by the angels flying around, but the, the locations form a rose cross. Some people have seen this as a very early hint that maybe there was a secret brotherhood uh, at that time, maybe practicing this kind of meditatio or contemplatio. The other influence, of course, we've covered the cross now onto the rose, uh, would be uh, the hermetic practice. You've heard about hermeticism early on in our symposium, so I need not go into it in depth. Hermes, of course, had a experience in deep meditation. Once when, think about the things that are, a sleep came across me. Not the kind of sleep that you'd associate with hard work or from eating too much, but an entirely different sleep. And whereupon my, my body became very heavy and my spirit soared to a great height. The hermetic philosophy tells us that all things are formed of one thing, of pure consciousness. The, the objects before you are uh, just more dense versions of those images you imagine in your mind. And with special training, 
that this can, of course, become trained and honed. The hermetic art of memory uh, was very much inspired by the Christian interpretation of many of the, the techniques in memory being applied to the teachings in the Hermetic uh, writings, the Corpus Hermeticum. So do you remember I talked about um, going through those levels of heaven? Well, in the Corpus Hermeticum, you are purified and you go through the, the levels um, of the planets, the spheres of the planets. This was seen as one the same. Do you remember in memory, we put statues or images of virtue. The Hermetic practitioners considered whether this could be applied to the secret teachings in the Hermetic texts, which talk about drawing divine beings or divine energy into a statue. What if the statue is in you? Could you work a miracle? Could you become a god if all the statues were formed in you? It does say in the Corpus Hermeticum that having imprinted on the memory the divine beneficence of the pure mind, I entered into a new state. The closing of the eyes became the new vision. Silence became the greatest wisdom. Uh, this idea that memory could lead to an enlightenment, uh, this is very much part of uh, the, uh, the tradition at the time. Hermes became kind of connected or associated uh, with uh, the whole figure of Enoch, because both had visited these higher places. And Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes the messenger, uh, thrice great, it must be the messenger of the Trinity. And you must practice memory, all messengers do. So this hermetic Christian interpretation is very much part of the memory practices of the day. Hermetic memory tended to use the analogy of a, a theatre rather than a biblical scene. And in this sense, the, the theatre was normally divided as follows. The stage represents the four elements. The uh, audience, seated area, the outside, uh, this uh, is, represents the, the planetary forces. And there are hints at a third stage, but that would go beyond the scope of this discussion. Uh, before you, you can see the memory palace of Giulio Camillo. And uh, this is probably one of the earliest overtly hermetic uh, memory palaces that we see. You can see that this kind of memory uh, practice appears in Rosicrucianism, sometimes in subtle ways. Uh, so you can see that emblems uh, appear like this one here, which is showing the invisible college and the, uh, the whole uh, Rosicrucian tradition in a, in a way that you could really contemplate and use. But also in actual manuals of contemplation, this beautiful book of Rosicrucian emblems by Daniel Kramer, this, this is actually a journey of your heart through a Christian form of enlightenment. And these are 40 symbols. And the idea is what you do is you memorize them and then you sit in contemplation and you really muse on them. Normally one at a time, but after you've kind of got that moving, perhaps you would connect them. And this would bring an, an enlightenment. Uh, you, the realization, that aha moment, but also just the, the imprint in the mind. This is like a use of a mandala. And you can see how early this is. This is very much part of the, the Rosicrucian tradition. If you haven't got this book and you are Rosicrucian, you must get it. Uh, someone needs to reset up a, a contemplative society within Rosicrucianism to, to work through these because they are really very special. Almost as special as this far later, this secret symbols of the Rosicrucian. This book is, you can see the traditions carried on and the instructions are quite overt in many of these alchemical 
and Rosicrucian memory manuals, where they are telling you to concentrate on it until there's nothing else, until you reach a state of oneness. Now, you remember I mentioned that the, the whole thing is divided into a, a square uh, art, as in the, the stage, and a curved art. You can see here before you, uh, we have a, uh, an image of the uh, picture from uh, Robert Flood. This is the Fortress of Health. And the aim here is that you're going to meditate on each of the four elements. Uh, the healthy uh, practitioner, that's how he's labeled, is praying to the four archangels here, and he becomes at one with those elements. So you are going to be as uh, fiery and ambitious as you are, are going to be as watery and adaptable. You're going to be as solid and earthy as you are going uh, to be as intellectual and at one with air. You're going to balance your humours. You're going to enliven these. You're going to make yourself ready for the next stage. The next one here, which is Basil Valentine. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Flood didn't depict his curved art. Uh, but he did describe how to do this very overtly in his mosaical philosophy. Um, this is uh, going to be the planets. You're going to summon these, be, these, these forces, probably even look at the planets and tune in uh, through meditation on them. You're gonna use memory to keep your mind on this. So you're gonna go through different images and connections and correspondence. Now, this is, uh, if, you, if you learn from Robert Flood, it's all heart-based. Robert Flood says that we've all got a resonance. We've got to tune in to the things we want to become at one with. And the contractions of the heart and the contractions, you will, you will really uh, gain that, that uh, energy will become a part of you. The next page, this is Giordano Bruno's uh, square and curved art. He, Bruno also overtly describes these two steps but of course he publishes his, his curved art first. Uh, the perfection of the character and everything is so basic that he has to sort of go back and do that when people don't understand what he's, he's teaching. Um, to understand Bruno, you really do have to memorize every single point that he asks you to in his shadow of ideas. And when you do, you really start to see this technique. For him, it's not so heart-based. It, that's a connection there, but it's more focused. He's like a yogi. He's like, you're going to meditate until you achieve oneness with this. These memory palaces uh, would be to help you tune into what you need to do. The first one is about on the four elements. There's a hint back to some of these early memory books called bestories here. Bestories were when you'd, you'd have it learn a lesson from an animal or become at one with that kind of animal in a, in a positive way to learn and to tune in. And then we move on to the planets. Notice how this structure is suspiciously similar to Freemasonry. We have a, a square art and then a curved art. Uh, moving on from there. So now I've given you a, a whirlwind tour of memory. It's time to move on to what would we be doing if we were to use the uh, tomb of Christian Rosencross as our memory palace. Well, the characteristics are quite clear and consistent. I want to make uh, this um, absolutely um, crystal clear from the beginning. I've used the original description of the vault, but because it describes the, that uh, there's a death of a European uh, or rather an English uh, Rosicrucian, and that there might be another one. There were all sorts of descriptions of vaults. And some of them you can see they are using more obviously as, as memory. But they all seem to have the same things. They have seven sides, they have angels on the roof or, or blessed uh, planets. The walls are decorated sometimes with spirit names or sometimes things related to them. Uh, there's, often there's just 10 squares there or there's a combination of them that light you remember sometimes that's a that's a, a lamp an everlasting lamp and sometimes there's a robot there's an automaton that protects the room it's real indiana jones stuff 
Now, going back to that, that temple of health, that, uh, that fortress of health, rather, um, let's look at that in terms of this practice. Many people have had a suspicion that this is, in fact, a, a depiction of what the top of that altar may be. You can also, you can see some suspicious things related to this in other depictions from around the time. This is uh, Abraham von uh, Frankenberg's, uh, this is the, a book called The Raphael Healing Angel. Now, if you read Flood's works and you read this work, they're both kind of uh, Paracelsian healing techniques, which involve tuning in to subtle healing forces. So having a resonance with the energy that would heal you. The original description of the altar does state quite clearly that we have a series of circles with specific engravings in them. It says that in the midst, instead of a tombstone, was a round altar covered over with a piece of brass. And on this was an engraving. This is the compendium of the universe I made uh, in my time, um, li my lifetime to be my tomb. And you can see around those uh, circles, uh, they, there are the following piece of writing. Jesus is my all. A vacuum exists nowhere. The yoke of the law, the liberty of the gospel, and the whole glory of God. You can see in this depiction, the very same uh, words appearing in slightly different area. So the whole diagram is called Jesus is my all, uh, but you can see in those rays coming out, the same words which were on the altar in the Pharma Fraternitatis. Now, this is very intriguing because both works, both floods and uh, this uh, particular work, the von, von Frankenberg's, this, these are absolutely um, counterposed to a practice of sympathy, of memory whereby you're going to be tuning into things. Um, but, um, Robert Flood, he goes through rather specifically how everything has a resonance and how it's all connected. And just at the end, he tells you, you can do this inside with images, with memories. So this is a way you can really connect to things. It is my um, firm belief that the square art of the Rosicrucians uh, would be on the altar. Uh, so they would be going through these different phrases as memory aids and the different images. Uh, you can see the four archangels in uh, of the elements in in one in uh, Robert Flood's images. You can also see in uh, the next image. These are now sort of watchmen. So you would start your practice imagining that you were lying in the tomb. You are Christian Rosencross, ready to be regenerated. And you would meditate on each one of the elements in turn. And you would have a memory practice associated with each one of these, going through the correspondence, the connection, until you really felt. There would be a preset idea that these elements would be regenerative and would uh, transform your body. And you would be in a state of pure focus during this practice. You'd probably have a teacher helping you do this. So you could kind of tune into that energy because they've already done it. Those who are practitioners for other systems will probably see how the elements start off there. You've got your own square and you're curved out in, in, in whatever you're doing, if it's uh, uh, of a similar, similar manner. Then I believe you would start to meditate on the ceiling. The ceiling, as you can see, um, this is uh, actually from the Vatican, would have the seven angels. And each one of these angels, you're moving on to your curved art. Now, this would be a very serious thing. You'd probably approach one of them subtly. You'd stand in the presence of the actual celestial um, uh, figure and let the light shine on you. 
There's some very in interesting references to this and Bruno actually standing in front of it. Uh, Bruno, of course, talks about the shadow. You're in the shadow of an influence. So this is kind of Neoplatonic stepping up here. So you would go through the angels. You'd start with Gabriel for the moon and uh, then you'd move up to sort of uh, the uh, next angel in, in the step. Maybe you'd be, um, you'd associate um, Raphael with Mercury and Joffiel with uh, the, and Venus and uh, maybe Michael would be uh, sort of fire, but there are different correspondence in the day. Uh, to, uh, so you would move up through these and this would be a very big process. You'd be deifying aspects of yourself through this one pointed mind upon uh, the, the angelic figure. This would have a natural side effect. It was believed at the time that if you were to have these divine influences, it would shine out. And I suspect that the walls would cover those kind of blessings. The fact they've got these little compartments so you can open them up probably means you can put memory aids in them. And I suspect it would have been something Kabbalistic. Uh, there's a reference in the, uh, the uh, perfect discourse to an upside down tree and it's kind of like the, the divine shines down and the fruits come down here, uh, the leaves. It's, and this is um, Flood's upside down tree. I suspect it would be either, the walls would either be the Sifroth or the choirs of angels. And you would imagine this divine blessing going out. So just as you heard about the Martinists doing this, this would be part of your meditation. You are now a divine conduit. This is these divine energies are shining out from you. You're blessing everything and everyone just by being. But then finally, and it's important that this would be a final process because your heart wouldn't be ready for this. These energies would play mischief with you and uh, would bring out your worst aspects. It's time to dominate the lower aspects. There's sometimes some hints that like Omphali uh, could uh, aid Hercules uh, by uh, channeling his energy, uh, that uh, someone of great development could help those in um, negative states to receive um, some sense of redemption by serving and by directing them. So you would overcome these forces. And maybe there was an idea that even because you were so alchemical, this could be turned to good. So I'm ending you on this picture here. This is a picture that would summarize the whole process. Um, uh, often these days you see diagrams and things hidden beautifully. You, you get a, a text uh, by Bruno and he suddenly does a picture of a, a boat and uh, a ship and tells you this is about some scientific principle and it actually has a hidden meaning. This is actually from a text which was more health and uh, hypochondria, you can see in the title. But this is actually an alchemical depiction where you can see uh, hidden in this alchemical language, this, uh, this process with the, the square and the curved uh, together. So uh, brothers, this concludes my assessment of what we would be doing if we were going to be using the, the tomb of Christian Rosecross as a a memory palace and uh, how we would perform this uh, in, in the manner that the original practitioners would have interpreted it. Uh, please do let me know if you have any thoughts or questions. Brother Martin Fox, thank you so much for rounding up our esoteric Masonic lockdown symposium that was uh, just wonderful martin uh, i did recently buy your, your uh, new publication of the memory palace so it's sitting on the shelf behind me it has been read i don't just put them up on the shelf when i get them uh, when i order through lewis masonic i, I do take the, the time to read them and i hope everybody else does uh, hopefully there'll be a couple of questions in the chat for for you. Uh, we've got a couple of people having to disappear for their tea and that, uh, and lots of people saying well done, uh, that was great. Barry Wilkes asked Martin, can, you mentioned the floor, the ceiling and the walls. Can you remind mm. us what the elements link to? Sorry, I missed it. That was the altar. So there is an, uh, an altar instead of a headstone. 
which has beautiful <coughs> sacred carvings on them and uh, those, those specific phrases. So I suspect you would start in the tomb, you are to be regenerated and transformed and you would start with the altar. Okay, thank you. I, I'm not sure. I... Alan Turton, one of our past masters, mentions the Rittman Library in Holland is a good source of these images I, for the Brown's information. Yes, I... indeed. Um, if you have a look on YouTube and put Martin Fox in there, you'll see some wonderful videos of me at the Rittman Library uh, learning from the excellent scholars that are there. And it is an amazing experience. When, when the world calms down, we should all visit that Rittman Library and Museum. It is, it is a superb place for a hermetic pilgrimage. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question myself because I think my, my interest has certainly been spun this afternoon about it. Can you train anyone in the art of memory or do they need to be open to it? Well, I find myself um, thinking of Brun Giordano Bruno was asked the same question. And uh, I will give you a far more polite answer than that than he gave in, in response. Um, yes, is the answer. We all have memory. And if memory is your weak point, this is where you should start training. Uh, learning to focus on the things you find hardest is a great source of uh, balance and will lead to a far more happy life. So, yes, is the answer. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to end on a, a comment that's just coming to the chat uh, before I do my roundup and my thank yous. And it's from, I think quite fitting, it's from our opening speaker uh, of the day, Brother Stuart Cleland. This was fascinating. It's hard for us to appreciate today but during this period, it was very possible for one person to know all knowledge, all human knowledge within the palace. And as I'm beginning to learn more about it, I, th I think that that is a very fitting place and very fitting statement to end. So, Brother Martin Fox, on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, thank you once again for giving up your precious time to join us. Uh, it's been a pleasure being in your company again. But in particular, Bern, to our five fantastic speakers who have been with us today, who have freely given up their time to help us make our daily advancement in Masonic knowledge. Uh, we, we started the morning, the afternoon off with Brother Stuart Cleland, giving us that academic introduction into esotericism. And I think that that really set the foundation for the rest of the day. And we were able to build on that introduction all the way through. Brother Joe Wages, who has come over the, the Zoom lines from America to be with us, took us into Germany in the Golden Rosy Cross and the original Masonic Rosicrucians and started showing to us that connection between Rosicrucianism and Masonry. Uh, prior to the, our break, we, we then welcomed Brother Ian Robertson, uh, who then talked about the influence of Scottish Rosicrucianism and arguably the birth of modern day Freemasonry. And I, I think he very much argued that point very well that uh, Scotland can take great credit in the development of what is seen as Rosicrucianism today. Uh, we, we gave you a, a little comfort break, Brian, uh, as all events should try to do. Uh, and we, we came back afterwards and we went to Arizona uh, virtually with Jamie Paul Lamb given us an introduction into astrological symbolism in Freemasonry. And as I said, Jamie, before you came on, uh, in my province here in Fife and Kinross, we, we have one lodge, Lodge Denern number 400, that has the signs of the zodiac on the roof uh, of the building. And we had one other temple that is now uh, in a state of disrepair and not used, uh, Lodge Union 250, that had astrological signs within the, the temple. And I think that was where we, as 
young five free message we first got that connection uh, and i'll try and find the book from union 250 and put some photographs up on the lodge hope of karachi uh, facebook page and brian as we just heard i uh, the tomb of christian rosenkrauts and the memory palace by brother martin fox uh, it's been a, a fantastic afternoon, Brian, uh, but it wouldn't have been the afternoon that it was without you all attending and posing some very deep and meaningful questions to our five presenters, which I think helped them uh, deliver what they've delivered to us this afternoon. Brian, this will be available on our YouTube channel. Normally it takes me a, a couple of hours to upload it, but that's for our normal lockdown lecture on a Tuesday, which is about an hour. So I've not really got a clue how long uh, four hours of uploading will take. So I, I won't promise it will be there today, uh, but hopefully at some point tomorrow. Can I invite anyone who's not already a member of the Lodge Hope of Karachi Facebook pages to please join us. We do have a weekly lockdown lecture uh, with an interesting Masonic speaker every week with discussion happening after it. And every day there's something of Masonic interest to, posted to help you make your daily advancement, particularly in these dark days of the third lockdown that we're facing here in the UK. Uh, before I, uh, I say to you all, uh, please unmute and say your thank yous to our five speakers. Uh, can I wish you, your families, all the best of health. Please keep safe and please follow the rules of the pandemic wherever you are in the world. And I hopefully look forward to meeting many of you face to face uh, in a Masonic Lodge or other order at some time in the future. Brian, on behalf of the members of Lodge Hope of Karachi number 337, Thank you for your attendance at our Masonic Esoteric Online Symposium. Thank you, Brian. Good night. Right, Worshipful Master, I would like at this time on behalf of the members of the Lodge to thank you for all your work in organising the symposium in these trying times. It was something we talked about having a, a symposium last year towards the end of your year in office, which has been extended by almost a year. So thank you once again on behalf of the members of the Lodge, and I'm sure the uh, brethren who have attended today will have the same thanks as well. Thank you, immediate class master. It's a labour of love, Brian. It keeps us going. It helps with my mental health as well. Uh, and then I, do, I, I can just see one of the Brian smiling there uh, and just a, a little shout out for Tuesday evening when we will welcome Worshipful Brother Dick and Sandbach to our lockdown lecture series at 7pm UK time and he's going to take us on a little sojourn and meander down the River Thames. Uh, some may say the greatest river in the UK, others would argue that that was a spay, but I'll leave you to decide which is which Brian. Good evening. Please unmute and say your thank yous and good nights. And I will leave the record on for a few minutes as that happens. And then I will stop recording. And you're more than welcome just to, to hang around. And I'll close the meeting uh, in about five, ten minutes. Thank you, Brian. Come on, Thank you, everyone. And to the presenters, a wonderful afternoon of Freemasonry <laughs> at its best. Thank you very much, one and all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much for the afternoon. Well done again, Gordon. Uh, and all the four speakers. Very enjoyable afternoon. Ian, yeah, thanks for serving me. Message. <laughs> Gordon, thank you for a wonderful afternoon of Freemasonry. Uh, you organising this has been a tremendous thing. Thank you to all our speakers for coming. And let's hope we can actually do this physically meet together and have another symposium like this because they really are invigorating. Thank you all. Thank you everyone for a great afternoon. Bye. Thanks for the excellent afternoon. It feels like an evening. Um, learned, learned a lot. So um, if that can be repeated at some point in some other form, that'd be great. Okay, Brian, you're, you're being very shy. It's not like you. So uh, I'll, I'll do our normal uh, Lodge Hope of Karachi countdown uh, that gives you an idea when we'll stop the recording. It's very simple, Brian. You don't need a lot of uh, the art of memory that Martin's just talked to us about. So I'll give you five, Brian. <laughs> I... Well, I'd just like to say thank you very much. My first time here, thoroughly. 
thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you, Martin. So You're more than welcome back anytime. And then Forburn. And Martin, the reason I start at five, I, I can't remember what comes above five, you see, and it's, uh, it helps me with the fingers, you see, so I need to read your book better. Uh, and, uh, and, three, uh, and three, Brown. And two. And I'll give you one, Brent, and thank you so much for joining us at our Masonic Esoteric Conference. Thank you to our speakers once again. Good night, Brent. Good night, Good night. 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 Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.